This is Audible. Follow Me Home. Written by D.K. Hood. Narrated by Patricia Rodriguez. Prologue. Then. Stop. Please stop. You're killing her. Trapped in a filthy cage beneath the bed, she pressed both hands against her ears and curled into a ball. Nothing would muffle their crude comments or the stink of their rancid sweat burning the inside of her nose. As she grasped the thin blanket, her elbows dug into the cold wooden floor. The unpolished planks scraped against her naked flesh, forming sore patches on knees and hips. She trembled in terror as Jody's screams penetrated through the gaps in her fingers. She would be next. The bed above her head squeaked, dropping dust into her eyes and suffocating her. The ritual was the same. The men barked orders, then the click, click, click and flashes of a camera. Each time they visited, Bobby Joe took her from the barred enclosure in the cellar and stuffed her in the cage under the bed. After they tired with Jody, she would suffer the same humiliation. The men owned her. Silence followed an uttering of curses. The next moment, Jody hit the floor. Her head rolled toward her, and she stared at her with wide, fixed gray eyes. The chain of the gold locket Jody treasured had left an ugly red pattern on her neck. She stared at her in horror. The girl she had known no longer existed. Her open mouth was set in a horrific grin, and the purple hue of her lips resembled one of the clowns who had brought her to this terrible place. Gripped with fear, she pressed a fist to her mouth to muffle the shriek threatening to spill from her lips. Bad things happened to girls who screamed. Jeez, Bobby Joe, you've gone and killed her. Shut your face, Eli. Damn it. Now I'll have to find me another blonde. Pick her up, Eli. I ain't touching no dead girl. Amos, grab her feet. We'll put her over here. Bobby Joe's sweat-soaked face came into view as he lifted Jody. Eli bent and looked at her. You'd better be a good girl. Shut your mouth and do as I say. She will, unless she wants me to take my knife and pay her mom a visit. Bobby Joe chuckled, sank to his knees, and grinned at her. You've just become our star attraction. What you gonna do with the other one? Chris peered at her friend with a concerned expression, then looked away. We can't leave her here to stink up the place. Wrap her in plastic, and we'll bury her over a Craig's Rock like the others. I'll get Stu to pick up a replacement as soon as he can find one. The critters are getting into them at Craig's Rock. Eli dropped a roll of plastic on the floor with a grunt. We'll need a new place for the next one. What about old Corky's place? It's downhill from here and it'll be easier. There's plenty of room under the floorboards for at least six or more. That sounds like a plan. Bobby Joe reached one long arm inside the cage, snagged her around the waist, and dragged her out. She did not struggle or try to run. Legs weak, she fell face first on the bed. Panic caught her breath. She wanted to scream, but pushed her mouth against the pillow and closed her eyes. I will survive. Determined to make it through another day, she bit down hard on her lip and chanted in her head, I am thirteen years old. My mother's name is Daisy, and my father's name is Luke. I live in Black Rock Falls, Montana. I have been here a hundred and forty days. Forget her! It's getting late! Amos grabbed Bobby Joe by the shoulder. We need to bury the other one tonight! We can start fresh tomorrow! She is all wrapped up and ready to be planted, Eli chuckled. Anyway, I'm plumb tuckered out already and after digging I'll need a rest. I guess. We'll need tools if you plan to lift up the floorboards. You can carry her and I'll bring my toolbox. Bobby Joe yanked her from the bed and stuffed her back into the cage. Come on then, let's get this over with.
Grab your flashlights, and one of you bring a rifle. I don't fancy meeting up with a bear. As their footsteps and voices faded, the house fell silent, and she gaped in astonishment at the cage door. The lock and chain lay on the floor. Terrified of one of them catching her, she pushed on the bars, and the entrance opened with a familiar squeak. With her heart in her mouth, she crawled out and peered around the cellar. The room was empty. Gasping with panic, she stared at the cellar steps, surprised to see the door slightly ajar and light streaming in from the room above. She froze, then moved her head from side to side, listening for any noise, any creak of floorboards. She heard nothing. Will I have time to escape? A discarded black T-shirt and a pair of socks lay on the floor. She grabbed the shirt and pulled it on, then the socks, doubling them over to protect her feet. Trembling with every uncertain step, she inched up the stairs. At the top, she found herself in a pantry and eased inside, then peeked out the door. After sucking in a deep breath, she slipped into the kitchen. Beer bottles, water, and candy bars littered the table. She looked nervously around, but the small cabin appeared to be empty, and a clear path led to a door at the back. I can make it to the back door. With her stomach knotted in fear, she edged toward the door and turned the knob. The handle turned with ease. She shrank back as anxiety trembled her knees. The moment she opened the door, Light would stream out into the darkness, alerting them. Frantic, she searched for the switch and turned off the kitchen light. Waiting until her eyes adjusted to the darkness, she listened again. When no noise came from outside, she snatched up some candy and a bottle of water from the table and opened the door. Heart pounding hard enough to break her ribs, she ducked low, then slipped out the door closing it gently behind her. Two steps down and into darkness, she could see the men's flashlights moving into the forest. The roar of water came from her left, and on the breeze, the familiar smell that only comes from a mountain-fed waterfall. Black Rock Falls. I know this place. She turned away from the forest and ran toward the noise of pounding water, Ignoring the rocks and broken twigs cutting through her socks, she kept moving. Her family had camped close by last summer, and the area was familiar to her. If she could reach the narrow track running alongside the falls, she could follow it all the way to the bottom of the mountain. Panic-stricken, they would discover her missing at any moment. She gasped at every noise, but kept moving. The roar of water guided her and soon the thick pine forest gave way to a narrow path bordered by rocks. The moon offered a ghostly light, but rocks littered the trail, and a constant spray of water from the falls made it slippery underfoot. Throwing caution to the wind, she ran. I have to get away. Throat dry and chest heaving, she lost her footing and fell, sliding down the steep incline. She dropped the water and grabbed a large prickly bush. Thank God it stopped her toppling over the edge of the falls. She lay panting, one hand still gripping the candy, and sighed with relief as the bottle of water rolled to her side. It seemed like she had been running for ages, and she desperately needed a few moments to catch her breath. Flat on her back, she stared up into the star-filled sky. Then a sound came over the noise of the falls. She listened, and every hair on her flesh stood up at the sound of loud voices and someone crashing through the undergrowth. She scrambled to her feet, and tiny rocks rolled down from above her, peppering her back. She turned, and her heart leapt in her chest. Bobbing flashlights lit up the mountain behind her. They're coming. Terrified, she dived under the bush and curled around the woody trunk. So close to the edge of the falls, ice-cold water splashed over her legs. Footsteps and heavy breathing heralded the arrival of two men so close she could reach out and touch them. 
With her pulse throbbing in her ears, she held her breath, too frightened to breathe, and tucked in her head. A light skimmed the top of the bush. If she ran this way, I figure she'd fall over the edge. Bobby Joe kicked at the loose rocks. It's steep and dangerous. Yeah, and we passed a pile of fresh bear scat. I doubt she got this far, and if she did, she'll be his dinner before morning. Chris turned his flashlight back up the mountain. We'll look around your cabin some more. You should send Eli and Amos home in case she drops by their cabins for help. Good thinking. The footsteps faded, and she waited until the lights moved out of sight, then crawled out of her hiding place and moved down the mountainside. As dawn came, she reached a cabin set close to the falls. Frightened one of the men would be inside, she grabbed women's clothes from the washing line and slid into the hen house to steal some eggs. After changing in the bushes, she headed back to the falls. Too scared to risk the monsters catching her, she kept away from the trail and hid during the day to rest. Days later, sick and starving, she reached the highway. She waved down a school bus and told the elderly driver she was lost. On the trip back to Black Rock Falls, she chewed on her nails. Bobby Joe knew where she lived, and if she told, he would kill her mother. She would lie and say she ran away, then no one would ever know. As she glanced out of the window at the mountain, she smiled for the first time in a very long while. I'm free. Chapter One Now Tuesday, Week One Amos Price opened the paper sack, and checked the items he'd purchased on Monday afternoon. The fourteen-year-old girl he met online insisted he bring a bottle of bourbon and a few other items to their meeting this afternoon. Tuesday had seemed to take a year to arrive, but he could not believe his luck and grinned. Excitement rippled through him. Her parents worked, and she had played hooky from school to be alone with them. It had taken weeks to convince her to meet him, and they had spent hours online in a games chat room. She thought he was eighteen and was so keen to meet him. Last night, after he'd given her the number of his burner phone, she had called. How sweet her voice sounded, so young and innocent. He pulled his vehicle up some distance from the address she had given him and grabbed the bag. Seeing the street empty and no other houses for some distance, he strolled to the front door. Finding it open just as she had said, he slipped inside. It's me, Pete. I'm here. A glimpse of the back of a girl with pigtails tied in pink ribbons rounded the top of the stairs. I'll be down in a moment. Desperate to have her, he headed for the steps. I'll come to you. No, I want my outfit to be a surprise. Go into the kitchen. I've made you a drink, cola and ice. You did bring the liquor, I hope. He nodded and smiled at her. Yeah, I have everything you asked me to bring. Great. Have a drink. I'll be right down. Amos strolled reluctantly into the huge kitchen and dropped his bag onto the counter. Nervous and excited at the same time, he took out the bottle of bourbon, added a splash to the drink, and gulped down half the glass. The sound of footsteps came on the stairs, and she walked into the kitchen carrying a cell phone and wearing sunglasses. She paused in the doorway, and with the afternoon sun streaming through the window behind her, he could not make out her face. Come closer so I can see you properly. I want a photo of you first. You're not 18. Why did you lie to me? She held up her cell phone and took a shot, but remained in the doorway, hesitant. You wouldn't have come if I'd told you my real age, but I wanted to meet you so bad. You're special, and we get along so well. 
Amos needed another sip of his drink, but smiled. Look at me. I'm harmless. I've had tons of girlfriends your age. I guess. His hands trembled and his chest felt tight. They often tried to back out, but he had ways to subdue them. He could slip some pills into her glass. Come here and have a drink so we can get to know each other. Finish your drink first. She moved closer, and with the sunlight streaming behind her, it was as if she wore a halo. Is it good? His heart pounded, and he pushed on the counter to stand, but his twitching legs failed to respond, and he sat back down. What's your name? Oh, I'm no one. She moved closer and allowed the light to stream onto her face. She was no more than five, two and had the slim body of a girl, but close up. He could see she was at least twenty. He pushed into his foggy mind to find a memory. Do I know you? I'm the Grim Reaper, and it's your time to die. The drink was poisoned. It will be a slow and painful death. Fear clutched his pounding heart. He tried to speak, but his tongue had swollen, filling his mouth. His throat constricted, and he struggled to breathe. Having trouble breathing? Is every inch of you screaming in pain? Good. I wish I could make it last for weeks, but you're not worth any more of my time. She scooped up the glass, then headed for the front door. Goodbye. I'll see you in hell. Agony spread through his shaking limbs, and he slid from the chair, falling hard on the floor. An ant scurried across the polished wood toward him, leading a few of its friends. He tried to move, to brush them aside, but a dark fog was surrounding him. Oh, shit. Chapter 2 Wednesday It was late afternoon, and Sheriff Jenna Alton stepped from her vehicle and took in the intense colors of fall. Shades of green through to golden brown bathed the entire landscape, and the air carried the sweet smell of wildflowers. She loved this time of year but plans to take a few days of her long-overdue vacation to spend away from town had been shattered. It's like I'm cursed. She stared into the blue sky and sighed. The moment life returned to normal in Black Rock Falls, something else happened to spoil her plans. Although, in truth, nothing in her life would ever be normal again. Under threat of death, she had left her life as DEA agent Avril Parker and assumed a new identity as the sheriff of Black Rock Falls. Her experience in the Drug Enforcement Administration was of little use in the spate of murders she had encountered in her time here, and at first she had coped with two inexperienced rookies and her old deputy, Duke Walters. She had to admit, after losing Daniels, Deputy Rowley had become an asset— but the sun had certainly been shining the day two ex-Marines joined the team. After a harrowing start, she discovered her second-in-command, Dave Kane, was a slightly damaged, off-the-grid D.C. Special Forces Investigation Command agent with incredible profiling skills and a sharpshooter. The next bonus came in the guise of Shane Wolf, a widower with three daughters, and not only the town's M.E., but a man with incredible computer skills. Wolf had settled well into life in Black Rock Falls and become a crucial part of her team. These new deputies had her back and sure made life easier. Jenna entered the ranch-style house, set amidst the shade of maple and pine trees. She covered her nose and peered through the kitchen door at the bloated body of a middle-aged man sprawled on the polished wooden floor. His eyes bulged from a blue-tinged face. She turned to Deputy Kane and raised one eyebrow. He's been here for a while. By the smell, I would say so. 
Kane's eyes narrowed. The real estate agent says he isn't the owner, and the house is listed for sale. Why is it so hot in here? She turned to Deputy Wolf, her in-house medical examiner. What do you think happened to him? There's no sign of a struggle, as far as I can see. If the house wasn't occupied, I would have figured he was unpacking his groceries and dropped dead. I'll leave this one to you, Wolf. We'll check the rest of the house. The thermostat has been set to 85 degrees. Wolf tapped one gloved finger on the wall control. Do you want me to turn it down, ma'am? Yeah, and get the windows open. She turned to Kane. We'll do a sweep of the house. She picked up her bag of equipment and followed Kane through the meticulously furnished ground floor. They checked the cellar and, finding nothing of interest, headed upstairs. Three bedrooms, all seemingly undisturbed. The faucet dripped in the main bedroom, leaving small splashes of water inside the basin. That's unusual. Seeing as everything else in here is perfect, I'll dust the vanity for fingerprints. She pulled the kit from her bag and tossed Kane a sample container. Remove the trap under the sink and collect the contents. She waited for him to complete the task. It looks clean. Kane held up a plastic container and frowned. I don't think anyone has been here. Jenna dusted the vanity and faucet for fingerprints. Nothing but a few smudged prints. If cleaners had been here, it's likely they left their prints, but someone left the tap dripping as if the sink was used in a hurry. It could have been an oversight. Maybe. She led the way downstairs and reported their findings to Wolf. I want to know how the man got into the house and what he was doing here. Check his pockets for a key. She turned away. With me, Kane. Who found the body? Allison Saunders. She is the realtor working at Mr. Davis's agency, and also the woman Deputy Rowley's apparently dating. Jenna followed Kane outside. I wondered why she was blubbering all over him. I guess finding a dead body in a house she was planning to sell to a young couple this evening was a little traumatic. Kane gave a nonchalant shrug. Maybe she can shed some light on how he got into the house. Maybe he was a potential buyer? Jenna strolled toward Deputy Rowley and a young woman with dark hair dressed in a neat skirt and blouse under a jacket. Miss Saunders, I'm Sheriff Alton. Are you up to answering some questions? Okay, but please call me Allison. She dabbed at her red eyes and gave Rowley a mournful look. What time did you find the body? About twenty minutes ago. I called Jake straight away. Not 911? Jenna pulled out her notepad and pen. Do you know the deceased? No, and he wasn't here on Monday when Mr. Davis did the house inspection. I don't know how he got inside. The door was locked when I arrived. Allison blinked her long, wet lashes. I came to make sure the carpets had been cleaned before I showed the clients. How many people have keys to the house? Let me think. Allison tapped her bottom lip with a red fingernail. This house used to be a rental. We have master keys for the houses, and we have two extras at the office, and the owner has a set. I have one with me. I gave one to the carpenter, Adam Stickler, and one to the cleaning service. That is the clean-as-a-wink housekeeping service here in Black Rock Falls. We use those people all the time, and they are very reliable. Jenna made notes. Did the cleaning service return the key? They keep a master key for their own use, but they finished here before Mr. Davis's inspection on Monday. I think they came after the carpenter left on Friday. He did mention some yard work needing doing. Allison's brown eyes fixed on Jenna's face. How did the man die? Was it a heart attack? I don't know, and we won't have a cause of death until the Emmy has examined the body. Jenna replaced her notebook and pen. You'll need to cancel the viewing for this evening. We'll be here most of the day and tomorrow, and when we clear the scene, you'll need to get the cleaners in again to get rid of the smell. Oh, Lord, nobody will buy the place now. We have to tell buyers about any deaths occurring in the houses. Who owns the property? 
Kane's gaze moved over the house, then back to Allison. Three Maple Lane is one of the seven properties Mr. Rockford has on our books. I met him recently, and so I know the man in the house is not him. Mr. Rockford moved to Texas after his son went to jail. Mr. Davis is acting as his agent for all the sales. Allison looked as if she carried the world on her shoulders. That's why I moved back to Black Rock Falls to work. There are so many properties on the market since those teenagers were murdered last summer. Jenna let out a long sigh. She remembered the Rockford case well. Did you have any tradesmen in to repair anything after the last inspection? As far as I am aware, all the repairs were finished. Allison's dainty fingers trembled on the folder in her hands. I'll have to ask Mr. Davis if he sent anyone out. Call me when you find out. Kane handed her a card with a compassionate smile. My cell phone number's on the back. You can call any time. Jenna stared at him, then turned her gaze back to Allison. Okay, that's all I need for now. You had better get back to work. I'm not sure if I can drive. Allison looked forlorn. I'm still shaking. You've had a nasty shock. Jenna turned away from her and spoke to Rowley. Drive her car into town and give me your keys. I'll drop your car back to the office. While you're there, find out if Davis sent any tradesmen out to the house. Yes, ma'am. Rowley's mouth twitched into a smile as he handed her the keys. Thank you. He led Allison to her vehicle. Sheriff, I need a word. Deputy Wolf came out the house, carrying a large evidence bag. The victim is Amos Price, 49 years old, and according to his driver's license, he has a cabin in the mountains on Sunset Ridge. And from what I found in his bag, I believe he was here for a romantic interlude, although he was also carrying tranquilizers in his pocket. Jenna listened to the list of items found with the body. I see. Time of death? Cause? Hard to determine the time of death from the body temperature. I'd say approximately 48 hours, but someone turned up the heat, so I could be off by days. From the artificially heightened body temperature, it would be a few hours ago, but from the decomposition, it could be Tuesday afternoon. I'll have to say undetermined. He is bloated, so the cause will have to wait for the autopsy. Maybe a heart attack, but right now I'm not sure. Wolf pulled down his face mask and scratched his blonde stubble. I can't rule out homicide at this time, so I'll dust the entire house for prints and do a complete search. I'll need the real estate agent's prints as well, as they both had access to the house. Okay. Jenna stared after the departing car. I'll call Rowley and get him to scan Stickler, Saunders, and Davis. I wonder if the battered truck parked down the road belongs to the victim. Kane rolled his shoulders and strolled toward the vehicle. He pulled out his cell phone and ran the plate, then turned to look at her. Yeah, it's his. Jenna turned to Wolf. Any keys on the body? Yep. Yeah. Wolf dug into the evidence bag, then held out the keys between two gloved fingers. I tried these in the front door lock. They don't belong to the house. Do you have gloves? Jenna pulled two pairs out of her pocket and tossed one pair to Kane. We'd better check the vehicle. She strolled to the truck. Roger that. As he kept pace beside her, Kane's attention moved over her face. I need to ask you something. Sure. You know, I was talking to Rowley about how hard it is to get to some of the more remote places around town. He suggested it would make sense for us to get a horse. You don't use the stables at your place, and the grass in the corral is a foot high. She nodded. Sounds like a plan, but the stables are a bit run down. It won't take me long to fix them. A couple of new hinges, and they'll be fine. Do you ride? Jenna gave him a sideways glance. I can ride. Well, I did the horse riding thing when I was a kid. She liked having Kane living in the cottage on her ranch and spent a lot of downtime with him. He was reliable and smart and always had her back. Often, after viewing a nasty crime scene, he would change the subject to lighten the mood, and his diversions somehow kept her human. It will be an added expense, though. And I guess we could rent horses if we need them. Then we'll have the availability issue. 
Kane shrugged. I'll pay for any upkeep, because with the expanse of forest and mountains we have in our county, we might need them in a hurry. The last time we investigated a murder, we trekked for miles up trails looking for evidence. A horse would have made life easier. We know Amos Price lived up in the hills, and if he doesn't have a family, we'll have to check his property. Some of the ranches are in remote areas, and neighbors are few and far between. Kane's lips thinned. His property could be miles up a trail. She considered his words, then shrugged. I doubt it. He has a truck and looks a little overweight to be walking miles. But if you want to buy a couple of horses, that's fine by me. I'll go and see Gloria on Sunday, and I'll fix up the stables. Kane's mouth twitched at the corners as he opened the victim's truck. Gloria? Yeah. Rowley insisted Gloria Smithers is the best person in town to go to if you want to buy a horse. I've been in touch with her, and she has a few mounts available at the moment. Kane allowed a pile of garbage to fall out of the door, then pulled on a mask and slid his large body inside the old truck. Man, this guy was a pig. There's mold half an inch thick on the garbage in here. Jenna covered her nose. How do people live like that? What do we have here? Grab this. I'm going in again. Kane peered over the mask at her as he tossed her a rifle, then bent inside again. Moments later, he stood and peered into a paper sack. Diazepam. Hmm. <laughs> These must be what Wolf found in his pocket. I wonder why he'd take tranquilizers on a date. Jenna stared at him in disbelief. Uh, maybe to drug her? It seems feasible, considering he was inside someone else's house. Yeah? Kane's brow furrowed. If you discovered a guy trying to drug you, would you just leave or call the cops? I wouldn't get myself into that position with a total stranger in the first place. Jenna rested one hand on the handle of her weapon and sighed. Maybe she didn't show, and he died of boredom waiting for her. She shrugged. There was a bottle of bourbon on the counter. Maybe it wasn't a date after all. He could have committed suicide. Diazepam and booze would do it. I've never heard of anyone taking condoms, lube, and a box of chocolates to a suicide. Kane's eyes danced with mirth. Have you? Jenna snorted back a laugh. I guess there's always a first time. Embarrassed, she glanced around. Oh, Lord, that's not a professional thing to say. The poor man is dead, probably murdered, and we're fooling around. Nah, just stating facts. Kane glanced at her over one shoulder. Did you know it's not unusual for people to laugh at murder scenes? She met his gaze. No, I didn't, but I'm sure you're going to tell me the reason. It's not because they think death is funny. It's an emotional release to guard against overwhelming anxiety. He disappeared inside the truck. In our line of work, I guess it's better to laugh once in a while than suffer from PTSD. He backed out and examined something in his palm. What have you got there? I found a thumb drive in the glove compartment. It might shed some light on his life, apart from the fact he liked takeout and bourbon. Kane threw the junk back inside the vehicle and locked the door. He has been here for a couple of days and lives on the mountain. Those places are pretty isolated, and he might have livestock on his property that needs tending. Yeah, most do up there. We'll head back to the office to see if Walters knows him or his relatives. He might have a family that can handle any animals. I'll see who lives close by as well and ask them. Roger that. Kane ripped off his mask, and his lips curled into a smile. If we don't have any luck, I figure I'd enjoy a drive into the mountains, spectacular views, and all the peace and quiet you could wish for. We'll be able to find the location of the victim's house using the GPS. Jenna's vacation plans would have to wait, but she had to admit the idea of getting away for a morning to enjoy the fresh mountain air sounded like bliss. Sure. Now can we stop daydreaming and get back to work? Chapter 3 Thursday Early the following morning, Kane leaned back in his office chair, 
gaping at the contents of the thumb drive he had found in Amos Price's truck. He glanced away, sickened by the images in front of him. Almost a year earlier, Jenna had found similar images on the cell phone belonging to the ex-mayor's son, but his father had destroyed his laptop, removing any clues to a potential child pornography ring working in the area. The FBI had become involved, but even with their extensive resources, they had uncovered Zip. He figured Josh Rockford had acted alone, and with him in jail, they had solved the problem. Obviously not. The find opened up a can of worms. If Price had been involved, then there could be others, and yet nothing had come to light since his arrival in Black Rock Falls. He pushed to his feet and marched into Jenna's office. Excuse me, ma'am. I think you need to be aware of this information in the Amos Price case. Come in and take a seat. Jenna tossed a lock of glossy hair from her face and smiled at him. What did you find? Kane winced. Images of children? They all came from the camera on his cell phone, so he was involved. It looks like the same child. Hmm. Did he send them to anyone? Nope. Kane dropped into a chair opposite her desk. Like the Josh Rockford case, he was too clever to use his cell phone to send the images. My guess is everything we need will be on a laptop somewhere. If news of his death leaks, we might have the same problem as we had with Rockford. One of his friends will take the hard drive and nuke it. Jenna tapped her pen on the desk. Predators pop up all over the place, but before we start checking out chat rooms for likely suspects, I'll contact the FBI again and see if they have an ongoing investigation in the area. Yeah, they wouldn't be too happy if we ruined a sting operation. Not only that, I want them involved. They have the resources and know where to look online. She sighed. A knock on the door heralded the arrival of Deputy Wolf. Ah, Wolf. You couldn't have arrived at a better time. Jenna's smile was genuine. She obviously appreciated having him on the team. What did the autopsy tell us? Not much, I'm afraid. Wolf removed his hat and scratched his thick, blonde hair. The cause of death is undetermined, pending a toxicology report. Problem is, the report takes about two to three weeks. We might hit pay dirt with the stomach contents. He had taken a drink just prior to his death. Apart from the bourbon and cola, it had a very strong smell of cigarettes. But his lungs appeared clean. I don't think he smoked. Kane frowned. I didn't find any cigarettes in his truck, either or an empty can of cola inside the house. Jenna's white teeth closed on her bottom lip. If he had a drink just before he died, what happened to the glass he used, or the cola can? Exactly. Everything I found points to poison as the cause of death. And from the contortions of his limbs, it was a very painful death. His body literally shut down in painful spasms, there are quite a few poisons that act immediately. For instance, arsenic, strychnine, and of course things like snake bite. But apart from them being difficult to obtain, they leave clues. Bite marks, for instance, and bleeding eyes or coughing blood. This was subtle. As I detected the high smell of tobacco, I asked the laboratory to check for nicotine sulfate. It's a pesticide and extremely poisonous. It would produce the symptoms I detected in the victim. It is colorless, and the taste could be disguised with bourbon. Kane rubbed the back of his neck. So this could be a homicide. I'm not ruling that out. If it is, then we have a motive. Jenna's dark eyebrows met in the middle in a frown. He has images of children on his cell phone, and it seems he took them himself. I can find no one within a few miles of Mr. Price's cabin, and none of the people I called are prepared to venture onto his land. I think we have three main objectives. The first is to hightail it up to his cabin and get his laptop to discover if anyone else is involved. If we find any clues, we'll turn them over to the FBI to investigate. We need to concentrate on the murders in town and identify the child in the images— for all we know, Price's death could be the parents taking the law into their own hands. Yeah. Wolf's pale eyes narrowed. 
If I found someone messing with one of my girls, I might be tempted to pay him a visit, too. We do things straight down the line here, Deputy Wolf. Jenna's expression hardened. No matter who is involved, understand? Yes, ma'am. Wolf rubbed the back of his neck. By the way, I would consider poison to be usually a woman's choice of weapon. He had an open bottle of bourbon, but I tested it, and it came up clean. There were glasses in a kitchen cupboard, but they all appeared untouched. I will have them collected and test for residue, but I doubt I will find anything. The tap under the kitchen sink came up clean. Whoever did this planned it well. Suggestions? Jenna shifted her attention to Kane. How he got inside the house without a key, for instance? I'm working on it, ma'am. I would like to know his incentive for going there in the first place. Kane met Jenna's intense expression and shrugged. To meet a girl? It's a possibility. Jenna scratched her cheek. Say we go with that assumption. What do we know about grooming kids? Pedophiles tend to go for a lonely kid. I figure they profile them to find a vulnerable subject to groom. They spend hours talking to them online. Kane sighed. The FBI has operatives masquerading as kids to sit online in chat rooms in an attempt to lure them. The predators use games rooms and other social media groups impersonating teenage boys. They have usernames and post an image of a good-looking guy, then start up a conversation. Once the FBI has them admitting to wanting sex with an underage girl or boy, they set up a meet and arrest them. Which makes me doubt the FBI has been working our area, or Price wouldn't have ended up dead. I guess if a killer wanted to lure a pedophile to his death, that scheme would work just as well. That's something to consider. Jenna's mouth turned down at the corners. Looking at what Price had with him, he was expecting to have sex, and intended to subdue his victim if necessary. It makes me wonder how many times he has done the same thing. Kane leaned back in his seat, making it creak in protest. Like I said, it would take time to groom a kid online, and he would need access to a house— we're back to wondering how Price knew when the house was empty, and how did he get in? You need to find that out. Alton's gaze narrowed. It's obvious. He had a key. Investigate. Kane cleared his throat. Yes, ma'am. The moment we get back from his cabin. We know a number of people who could have a key. Allison mentioned tradespeople had worked on the house— any one of them could have made a copy. Jenna's intent gaze moved over the deputies. Before we leave, Wolf, I need you and Rowley to pull up any files we have on victims of child abuse in the area. You'll need to check the archives. We found no complaints at all during the Rockford case, so you'll have to search the national database. Check the girl in the photographs against missing persons. Go back some years. Kane rubbed his chin. You were talking about hundreds of thousands of missing kids. It is an impossible task. I suggest start in the neighboring towns and work out. Yeah, we don't know for sure he intended to meet a kid, or in fact if he met anyone at all. Wolf looked chagrined. Well, further speculation will have to wait until we look at Price's computer. Alton picked up the phone. Deputy Walters, did you locate Mr. Price's family? She listened for some time, then shook her head. Give me the coordinates to his home. Thanks. She made notes, disconnected, then pushed the pad toward Kane. Price has no living relatives. Walters believes the unsealed road up to Price's cabin should be passable this time of year. Check if we can access the area by SUV. Apparently, another road leads way up on the north side to a few cabins locals hire out when fishing at Black Rock Falls— but a rock fall blocked the road. The water from there feeds Black Rock Lake, a huge area on the other side of the mountain. Apparently, the rock fall doesn't show up on the GPS. She stood. I'm sure your SUV is powerful enough to climb the hill. Oh, yeah. That baby will do it with ease. Kane could not help the smile. I'll check the road conditions and get the gear together. Will you or Wolf be coming with me? Oh, I'm coming. 
Jenna's eyes flashed. Wolf, I want you to coordinate the search for the victim in the photographs and cases of child abuse here or in neighboring towns. Notify the FBI we have a potential pedophile ring operating in the area. They'll know all the usual haunts of these people, and we'll be able to handle that part of the investigation. Make sure you insist we are kept in the loop. She glanced at Wolf. Before you start, send Rowley to collect the glasses from the murder scene. I've trained him in the correct collection of forensic evidence. Yes, ma'am. Wolf gave her a curt nod, picked up his hat, and headed for the door. I want you both ready to go in ten minutes. Jenna's voice followed them. Kane followed Wolf from the room and noticed Rowley deep in conversation with Allison Saunders, the young woman who had found the body. He strolled toward Rowley's cubicle and cleared his throat. Problem? No, not exactly. Rowley's cheeks pinked. Allison wanted to know how long it will be before we can get a cleaning crew inside the house. I didn't mean to get Jake into trouble. Allison's big brown eyes moved over his face. I just needed to know when I could get back into the house and if the man was murdered. Kane shot a glance at Rowley. The deputy was usually discreet and professional. And what did Deputy Rowley tell you? He told me the sheriff would let Mr. Davis know when she had finished the investigation. Kane heaved a sigh of relief. Well, then, you have your answer. At the moment, we have no idea how the man died. It could take weeks, so if Mr. Davis is pressuring you to obtain information from Rowley, tell him to contact Sheriff Alton. Oh, sure. If that is all, Miss Saunders, Deputy Rowley is needed elsewhere. I'll see you later. Allison smiled brightly at Rowley and headed for the door. Kane watched her go. I'm sure I don't have to remind you not to give out information, even to your girlfriend. We could have a possible homicide, and we don't want any leaks. No, sir, I wouldn't tell her a thing. Rowley swallowed hard, making his Adam's apple bob up and down. What did Deputy Wolf discover in the autopsy? Nothing positive yet. Kane lowered his voice to just above a whisper. We believe the deceased was involved in some kind of child porn ring. Wolf will be coordinating a search for the kids in the images and bringing in the FBI. Hunt up any reported cases of child abuse and do a complete rundown of Price's employment history. Find out if he worked with kids in the last couple of years. We'll need to find out if he procured kids from another town. So search the other county's data banks for missing kids or reports of anything suspicious. Okay, I'll get onto it as soon as I get back from collecting the evidence Wolf needs from Maple Street. Okay, I'm heading up the mountain with Sheriff Alton to search Price's cabin. Oh, make sure you take a rifle with you. Rowley's face broke into a grin. Folks up that way tend to shoot first, then ask questions later. Wonderful. Chapter 4 The adrenaline rush of killing slipped away, leaving a wave of contentment. She glanced around her neat home, everything in its place, all surfaces polished to a high shine. She liked clean. In fact, one thing out of place, one speck of dust, annoyed her. And right now, she had some cleaning to do. She opened the cupboard door in the spare bedroom and stared at photographs of the monsters. To enforce her determination to rid the earth of predators, she had stuck the images to the inside of one door, and on the other, the missing girls she had found in the newspapers. She touched each young face. I will get justice for you. I promise. She scowled at the men's images and rage sent bile rushing up the back of her throat. Oh, yes. She had discovered the monsters' names and where they lived. Now she would stop them from hurting girls. She had tracked down Amos Price after overhearing about the strange behavior of a clown at a kid's party. She wondered how many times parents ignored inappropriate touches and kids' complaints because they were too ashamed to admit such a thing had happened to their child. She had stopped him, the monster hiding behind a painted smile. 
With satisfaction, she tore Amos Price's image from the wooden door and ripped it into shreds, then strolled into the bathroom and flushed it down the toilet. The sight of him writhing in agony and the fear in his eyes as his life slipped away had ignited the dark side again. She enjoyed his suffering, could almost taste it, and wished it had lasted longer. The craving to lure the next man into her web had become an obsession, an absolute need to hunt down and kill. Who will be next? She let her gaze drift over the photographs, then dragged her nails down the image of a monster. Are you ready to die? Chapter 5 As Kane's powerful SUV climbed up the winding mountain roads, eating up the miles, Jenna let out a sigh. A vista of intense beauty stretched out forever. Pine forests climbed up magnificent mountains, swirling rivers, and dancing waterfalls through a myriad of rainbows, making the view magical. Ah. Oh. This is magnificent. I wish I had ventured up here earlier. I can't believe I've missed seeing this before. It is amazing, but not somewhere you should venture alone. Kane's large hands gripped the wheel as he negotiated a tight bend in the road. Rowley mentioned that the mountain men, wherever they are hiding, tend to shoot first and ask questions later. He grinned at her. Then there are the black bears and the bobcats. I guess you'd look like dinner to them. You wouldn't, she returned his grin. You're all gristle. Thanks, Kane's eyes sparkled. I'll take that as a compliment. Jenna stared at the GPS. Price's cabin should be down a track on the right about a hundred yards ahead. The car bumped over the dirt road tipping from one side to the other. The trees came close to the road, sending zebra shadows flashing past as they moved in and out of the sunshine. There, on the right. See the private property sign? Got it. Kane spun the wheel and expertly negotiated a bend, then a dip in the road. No wonder his truck was so beat up. This place would be murder during the winter. He indicated a head with his chin. There's the house. Jenna stared at the log cabin. It was larger than she expected, with a woodshed and a small barn. An old hunting dog ambled out to greet them. It was pitifully thin, with its bones showing. You were right about the livestock. I wonder what he has in his barn. I guess we'd better check there first. Kane slipped from the car and raised both eyebrows. I can't smell livestock. He trudged off toward the barn. Jenna patted the old dog on the head. Don't worry, we'll find you something to eat. His water bucket is empty. Anger radiated from Cain. A hunting dog doesn't get that thin in a couple of days. Up here, he could have caught his food. He bent and filled a bucket from a faucet attached to a rainwater tank. Come here, boy. There you go. He turned and pulled open the barn door. Nothing in here. Okay, let's check the house. Jenna pulled on a pair of latex gloves, then took a set of keys from her pocket. She strolled onto the porch, opened the door, then took a step backward. Man, this place stinks. Not death. That's the smell of the unwashed. Kane's mouth curled into a grin. It seems Amos Price wasn't one for personal hygiene. He moved inside the door. Wait here. I'll open some windows. I'll check the bedrooms. Jenna strolled into what looked like the master bedroom, and her attention settled on an array of wigs on the nightstand. She threw open the cupboard doors and gaped at the rack of brightly colored clown costumes. A shudder of revulsion went through her. When Kane walked into the room, she turned and grimaced at him. He was a clown. I hate clowns. He's a dead clown now. Kane's blue gaze moved over her face. It's a real phobia, isn't it? 
clowns, I mean. Yeah, and John Wayne Gacy didn't do much to help their cause either. She shuddered. In case you forgot, he was a mass murderer of little boys. I'm not likely to forget him, but I wish I could. Kane squeezed her arm, and the heat of his hand felt comforting against her skin. You okay? I'm fine. She turned away and walked down the passage into a family room with a fireplace, a couple of old sofas, and little else. Through an open door, she found a kitchen with a sink piled high with dishes. I'll see if there's anything to feed the dog. She had not taken three paces when she heard a noise. Did you hear that? What? A tiny sound froze Jenna on the spot. She tilted her head from side to side. An eerie feeling crept over her, as if a ghost was reaching out of a grave to speak to her. I thought I heard a voice. A really creepy sound, like a whine, maybe. Listen. Maybe it's the wind. Or maybe a cat. I had a Siamese who sounded like a baby crying. She strained her ears, and the sound came again, sending goosebumps running up her arms. It sounds like a child. From behind, Kane dashed back down the hallway, pushing open bedroom doors. Then he turned his large frame slowly and stared at a door sealed with a wooden slat. Oh no, not the cellar again. I am so over going into dark cellars. His biceps bulged as he lifted the substantial piece of wood barring the door. This is strong enough to keep out a bear. He glanced at Jenna over one shoulder. You don't think he has a pet panther, do you? His brow wrinkled. A very hungry pet panther. The whine came again, throwing every horror movie to the front of Jenna's mind. Real, she could deal with. Spooks, not so much. She forced her mind to think rationally. It can't be a ghost. They move through things. I didn't think it was a ghost, but some people do believe spirits get trapped in places. Kane shrugged. It's more likely a big cat. I think I'd prefer a ghost. Jenna moved to the door, keeping her back to the wall. Open the door a crack and be ready to slam it shut if it is a damn panther. I've heard they have a strange call. Yeah, they sound like a yell or a cry. I'll wedge my foot behind the door. She moved closer. This is Sheriff Jenna Alton. Is anyone down there? A small, quivering voice echoed from the darkness. So ghost-like, cold chills slid down Jenna's back. Yes, I'm down here. Every hair on the back of her neck stood to attention. Are you alone? Are you really a sheriff? Jenna nodded at Kane to open the door a few more inches. Yes, I'm here with Deputy Kane. Jenna gagged at the stink of sewage wafting up from the dark beyond and turned to Kane. No way she was entering the cellar in the dark. Can you see a light switch anywhere? Yeah, here by the door. His voice lowered to a whisper. Be careful, Jenna. She could be his crazy old mother and is an unknown quantity. Jenna slid her Glock 22 from the holster. Open the door. Pressing one hand over her nose, she moved onto a small landing and surveyed the cellar. It held a large double bed and a cage. Inside the cage sat a young ten- or twelve-year-old girl wearing filthy rags. Oh, my God. Chapter 6 Holstering her gun, Jenna ran down the steps toward the cage. It's okay. You're safe now. What's your name? Zoe. Zoe Channing. Jenna went to the girl. You're gonna be okay. She turned to Kane. She's the one in the photograph. So I see. She shook the sturdy metal door and turned to him. Get something to bust her out of here and bring some water. As Kane took off, thundering through the house, Jenna smiled at Zoe. 
I'm going to get you out of here. Where do you live? I live in Helena. That's a lovely place to live. Jenna squatted by the door. How long have you been here? A long time. Lots of weekends. I can't remember how many. Zoe wrapped filthy arms around her knees, flinching away. Why does she measure time by the weekends? Jenna turned and did a visual search of the room. She noticed a pile of blankets on a shelf and pulled one down, then passed it through the bars. Here, wrap this around you. Deputy Kane is going to break the door and get you out. Can I have a shower? Zoe's sunken eyes pleaded with her. Amos didn't let me wash. They never let me wash until they're ready to leave. They? Jenna stared at her. Yes. Amos brought three of his friends here every weekend. Her small body shuddered. When he went out, he said he was bringing a friend home for me. He said her name was Fresh Meat. The girl's measure of time slammed into Jenna like a steel pole. She stopped the overwhelming wave of disgust from reaching her expression. Amos won't be bothering you anymore. He's dead. Kane's footsteps sounded on the stairs, and Zoe cringed, her eyes filled with terror. Jenna reached through the bars and took her hand. It's okay. Kane is my deputy, and he's here to help you, just like I am. We will catch the men who did this to you. She took the bottle of water Kane handed her and gave it to the girl. My dad is a lawyer. He says bad men go to jail. Keeping her brown eyes firmly on Kane, she opened the bottle and drank thirstily. Oh, don't worry, they'll go to jail. Move away from the door and I'll get you out. Kane's expression turned to one of determination as he slid a crowbar between the door hinges. The metal creaked and groaned, but moments later, the door clattered to the floor. Jenna offered her hand. Come with me. The young girl shrank back, her eyes filled with fear. Jenna held up a hand to keep Kane away. I think she has had her fill of men. Leave her to me. We'll take her to the hospital. Call ahead and arrange for a female doctor, will you? She frowned. The dog will have to come with us, too. We can drop it at the animal shelter. Yes, ma'am. Kane's brow creased into a frown. I noticed a laptop in one of the bedrooms. I'll bag it, then do a quick search while you're getting ready. Sure, grab what you can, but Zoe is our priority. She waited for Kane to leave, then helped the girl to her feet. I'm taking you to the hospital. The doctors will check you, then you can take a shower. I'm hungry. I haven't had lunch. Jenna placed one arm under the girl's arm and helped her climb the stairs. I have energy bars in my car and orange juice. I'd rather not touch anything here. I like energy bars. Zoe seemed to brighten. I'm glad you found me. So am I. Jenna led her into the kitchen. Sit down for a minute and sip the water. We'll have you out of here soon. Can you feed the dog? Zoe's lip quivered. Amos was watching him starve to death. He thought it was funny. I'm glad he's dead. Right now, so am I. He wasn't a nice man, was he? We'll feed the dog. Don't worry. She glanced down the hallway as Kane came out of a room with a laptop, a couple of external hard drives, and a number of DVDs in a large evidence bag. Did you find any dog food? Not yet. Jenna frowned. He must have something we can give the poor thing. Check the freezer. Yes, ma'am. Kane stood beside Jenna. Despair etched his face. Zoe, I promise we'll catch the men who did this to you. He pulled open a freezer grabbed a couple of steaks, and threw them into the microwave to defrost. Zoe leaned into Jenna, and her big brown eyes moved over Kane's face as if assessing a threat. Maybe you should just shoot them dead.
Chapter 7 With difficulty, Cain tried to force down the rage bubbling inside him. He needed to portray a calm, professional persona in front of the girl. Any show of aggression would make her even more terrified of him. He ground his back teeth so hard, his jaw ached. The sight of the girl's bruised face made his blood boil. Amos Price might be dead, but three low-life animals walked the earth. And right now, he wanted to tear them apart with his bare hands. What kind of a man does this to a child? He waited for the old dog to finish eating and loaded him into the back of his SUV. Jenna had Zoe wrapped up and sitting inside the vehicle munching on energy bars. He slid into the driver's seat and noticed the way Zoe flinched at his closeness. No one ever recovered from what she had endured, and she would suffer repercussions for years. After reading so many case histories of psychopathic killers, abuse as a child was a trigger no psychologist should ignore. He glanced at Zoe. She appeared to be communicating reasonably well, which was unusual after continuous trauma. He had seen kids shut down completely and not speak for years. The ones who blocked out trauma usually crashed and burned. Before we leave, get Wolf and Rowley up here to go over the place. We need to find out who else is involved and tell them we have identified the girl in the photograph. Okay. He contacted Wolf, brought him up to date with the investigation, and arranged for him to lead up a forensics team to sweep the cabin. As Zoe had implicated other men in her ordeal, they needed evidence. If the men had left a trace of DNA, Wolf would find it. He would work hand-in-hand hand with the doctors at the hospital and confirm the findings by using his own lab to process the results. I'll contact her parents. Jenna flicked him a worried glance, then turned in her seat. Zoe, do you remember your phone number? I know my dad's number. Zoe rubbed a dirty finger over her nose, as if thinking, then gave the number. I think that's right. My head... Feels strange. That's just fine. I'll keep trying until I contact him. Jenna lifted both eyebrows at Kane in a meaningful stare and called the number. Let's get out of here. He drove down the mountainside, bumping along the pitted, uneven roads, relieved when they finally reached the highway. Then, lights flashing, he sped down the blacktop in the direction of Black Rock Falls General Hospital. Jenna had said little to Mr. Channing, other than his daughter was alive and she was taking her to the hospital. When she disconnected, Kane turned to her. It will take him some time to get here from Helena. He is going to arrange a ride in a helicopter. He is heading home now to collect his wife. Jenna leaned back in the seat, her face pale. When we arrive, I'll inform the hospital he will be landing on their helipad. Her brow wrinkled into a frown. She has been missing for six months. Jesus. Kane cleared his throat. As she is talking to you, maybe you should ask her about the other people she mentioned. The hospital will sedate her the moment we arrive. Yeah, okay. Jenna's mouth turned down. She pulled out her notepad and pen, then turned in her seat. Zoe, what's the dog's name? Stupid. But... I don't think it is his real name. Zoe chewed on her bottom lip and shrugged. Oh, I see. Was he here when you arrived? No. Amos said he came from the animal shelter about three weeks ago. Zoe sipped the orange juice and sighed. He isn't stupid. I like him. When Amos locked him in the cellar, he would sit with me and listen to me talking. I think he knows what I told him because he didn't like Amos and growled at him. She rubbed the tip of her pink nose. You won't take him back to the animal shelter, will you? I don't think he likes it there. A pang of pity wrenched at Kane's heart. Nope. He glanced at Jenna and shrugged. I'm gonna look after him. We'll find out his real name. The animal shelter will have a record of him.
Dogs and horses? Jenna shot him a worried glance. What next? Cattle? Kane shrugged. I'm not sure. I'll have to ask my landlady, but I think she'll be a pushover when I tell her about the dog. Stanton Forest boarded the highway. Tall and dappled green, the pines stood like sentries guarding the way to the falls. He looked behind him at the incredible mountainside bathed in sunshine. Saddened, the majestic beauty had hidden such atrocities. Not long now. Jenna gave him a knowing look. Zoe, do you remember the names of the others who came to visit you? No. Zoe stuffed another energy bar into her mouth and chewed. Okay. Jenna's tone was light and conversational. How many men did you see? Was it always the same amount? Yes. Three and Amos, like I said before. Unable to keep quiet a moment longer, Kane took a deep breath. Do you remember what they look like? Zoe's brown gaze narrowed. I don't want to talk to you. Okay, he won't say another word. Jenna gave him a look good enough to freeze Black Rock Falls Lake, then smiled at Zoe. What color hair did they have? I don't know what they look like. They wore masks. She scratched her dirty, tear-tracked cheek. One came by yesterday morning real early. He kept asking me where Amos had gone. He didn't let me out, but he did leave me a pile of food. Interesting. Kane glanced at Jenna. He might live close by. Well, let's say in a five-mile radius, I guess, looking at how the cabins are spread out up here. Yeah, it will be a huge undertaking to search the mountain. Jenna's attention moved back to the girl, and she smiled at her. Is there anything else you remember about them? Scars or tattoos? One had a spider with a red back on his hand. He was mean. Zoe's bottom lip trembled. One had a scar on his belly, low on the right side. I don't want to talk about them anymore. Jenna gave the girl a bright smile. I am so proud of you telling me all those things. Just rest now. We'll be at the hospital soon, and your parents are on their way. Will they be mad at me for running away? No. Jenna handed her another bottle of water. I spoke to your dad, and he is very happy you were okay. That's good. And if you speak to him again, tell him I was silly to run away because he flushed my dead fish down the toilet. I guess burying them in the garden was a stupid idea. Jenna gave Kane a tragic stare, and he could see her eyes filling with tears. She cleared her throat, and her voice cracked a little. I'll tell him. Chapter 8 Eli Dorsey's day could not get any worse. His friend was missing, and had been for three days. After visiting his house and seeing his truck gone, he had let himself in using the key under the flower pot by the door. The girl told him he had not been there since Tuesday. Concerned about his friend's absence, he fed the girl and left. After calling Amos's cell phone from a public phone and getting no response, he went home, not sure what to do. He waited until late afternoon, then decided to drive past the house where Amos planned to meet the new girl. He discovered his truck parked some ways from the house, and to his horror, crime scene tape barred the front door. Immediately, he headed back to his friend's house to grab the girl. He took the alternative route, parking his vehicle along an old logging road and hiking the half-mile down the mountain to Amos's cabin, glad he had taken the extra precautions when he found it infested with deputies. Amos wasn't the smartest, so he might have guessed his friend would mess up. He rested his binoculars on the edge of the rock and peered down at the cabin. The deputies' vehicles had been outside the house for hours, 
but there was no sight of Amos or the girl. An anxious gripping rolled his stomach. If the new girl's parents had come home early and caught Amos in the house, the cops would have arrested him, and searching his house would have been normal procedure. He rubbed his chin and rolled back on his heels to think. The deputies moved in and out of the house carrying plastic bags, and it did not take a genius to know they were collecting DNA and fingerprints. He sighed in relief. They'll find nothing. He and his friends had been very careful, and not one of them entered Amos's house without wearing gloves. They laundered the sheets on the bed after each session and washed the plastic sheeting covering the bed with bleach. After the last scare, they took no chances. Amos might live like a pig, but every weekend when he and the boys left the love nest, the cellar was spotless. They even incinerated the paper bag from the vacuum cleaner. They left nothing to chance. The girl locked in Amos's cellar would not be able to identify them either. Living in fear after one of Bobby Joe's girls had escaped, they had been extra careful, worn gloves and clown masks. The deputies would get nothing out of her. She was as scared as a rabbit and frightened they would kill her family if she ever told. It was getting late, and he made his way back along the trail to the road leading to his secluded cabin, tucked under an overhang and hidden by trees. He climbed into his SUV and arrived home in time for dinner. Missy clanked around the kitchen, dishing up his meal. At eighteen, she was getting too old for him now, but she served her purpose. She cooked and cleaned without complaint. In fact, she told him she enjoyed caring for him, but he kept the chain attached to a well-padded metal cuff around her leg just in case she decided to escape. He stared at her thin face and sighed. His heart sank. All week he had expected to find a new girl waiting for him at Amos's house. Now it looked like he would have to go to the trouble of finding one. He pushed down the urge to call Bobby Joe or Chris, They'd all agreed to only communicate face-to-face -face or via public phone. At any time, the cops might arrest one of them, just like Amos, and they made sure they did not leave a trail for the cops to follow. After eating his dinner, he headed into his man cave and opened his laptop. The new wireless tower on the top of the mountain gave him high-speed access to the Internet. Confident he could find a suitable replacement in one of the online teen social groups or the many games chat rooms, he signed into one of the sites. After scrolling through the requests, he found an interesting post. A young girl was complaining her date had failed to arrive and left her disappointed. At fourteen years old, she sounded perfect. He responded, and to his delight, she replied. From the conversation, he realized with a jolt this had to be the girl Amos had been grooming for weeks. Knowing what she wanted to hear, he told her lies. One of the many things he had perfected over the years was persuasion. He offered her the world, then told her she would be safe with him because he was such a nice kid. He gave her the number of his burner phone and waited with anticipation for her to call. The ringtone pealed out and he took a deep breath. Hello? This is Needy Girl. As you are going to be my first boyfriend, I would really like to know your real name. Just your first name will do. Struck by her soft, girly voice, he did not think of the consequences and blurted out, Eli. Ah, oh, that's such a nice name, she giggled. See you soon. Chapter 9 Friday Depressed, Jenna stared out her office window in an effort to lift her spirits. The town came alive during the carnivals, with the townsfolk throwing themselves into events with gusto. The fall festival was underway, and being Friday, 
there would be an art show in the community hall, a parade down the main street, and the usual displays of arts and crafts, home baking and the like, filling tables along the sidewalk. Wishing she could be anywhere but inside, and facing the terrible fact a group of child molesters had moved into her town, or worse, had been operating under her nose for years, Jenna dragged both hands down her face and moaned. Her life as sheriff had been complicated and difficult. It was not the cozy neighborhood disputes and parking tickets she expected when she agreed to move to this backwoods town. After leaving her life as an undercover DEA agent and living in witness protection with a new face and name, life should have been sweet. Instead, the sleepy town of Black Rock Falls hid more secrets than the labyrinth of Egypt— it would seem that lowlifes, murderers, and criminals regularly haunted the picturesque streets. The current horrific crimes made her appreciate her senior deputy's efficiency, although at first it had been a fight of wills. Both highly qualified men, she had utilized their skills, and now they worked seamlessly as a team. New deputies would be arriving soon. And although the lightening of her workload would be a relief, she really did not want the hassle. Voices outside her door reminded her the staff meeting was due to start, and she would have to put on a good front to hide her anxiety from Kane. They had become close friends over the last year, and his incredible profiling skills worked on every level, including reading her like a book. She straightened at the knock at her door. Yes, come in. The deputies filed in and took seats, with the exception of Walters. She had him on duty all day at the nurse's station at the local hospital. Although Zoe was on a special floor reserved by the sheriff's department for injured victims or prisoners, she wanted the added security. Worried the other men in the pedophile ring would realize Zoe was missing by now, she wasn't sure what they would do to stop her from identifying them. Jenna flicked a gaze over her deputies and folded her hands on the desk. I called the sheriff in Helena about Zoe's case. He told me he had called in the FBI child abduction rapid deployment team when she was reported missing. They found no trace of her, and he said it was as if she had vanished. He is sending the files and notifying them, so they will be contacting me soon for our case files. As Zoe will be returning to Helena as soon as she is cleared by the hospital, I suggested the agents on her case speak to her then, rather than coming here and distressing her further. I don't think they'll have any relevant information regarding Price's murder. Kane shrugged. She nodded in agreement. Deputy Wolf, do you have anything to report? Well, yes and no. Wolf's eyes brightened. I've mentioned the strong smell of tobacco coming from Mr. Price's stomach contents, and I had a hunch, so I ran a test specifically for nicotine sulfate, and it came back positive. Interested, Jenna leaned forward and scribbled a note in her book. Can you explain its significance? It's a clear liquid and used as a pesticide, amongst other things. It is a highly toxic substance and results in a nasty death. It is not something anyone would ingest on purpose. Due to this finding, I am ruling his death as a homicide. Wolf sighed. How he drank the substance is a mystery. It was not present in the bottle of bourbon he had with him. We found no glass or empty can of cola to indicate he drank the poison at the house. But if he had taken the poison earlier, he wouldn't have made it to the location. Apart from being a great receptionist, Maggie is great for doing research. I'll ask her to find out if it is available anywhere in town. If it's unusual, the storekeeper might recall selling a bottle to someone local. She cleared her throat. Do we have a time of death? Not conclusive. The heat inside the house increases the speed of decomposition, so using the usual body temperature of the victim as a guide was redundant. It's obvious the killer turned up the thermostat to confuse the time of death. We can only go on the time frame between Mr. Davis's inspection and Miss Saunders' visits to the house. What about fingerprints? Who else was in the house? 
We found Amos Price's fingerprints on the front door, the bottom of the handrail to the stairs, and on the kitchen counter. Miss Saunders' fingerprints were on the front door and on the kitchen door frame. The others all corresponded to the cleaners and a tradesman. The two cleaners who visited the place two days prior have a GPS in their van. It is a mother and daughter team, Rosemary and Lizzie Harper. We can place them in the immediate area over the two-day period. The tradesman is a carpenter. Kane scanned her face. Adam Stickler moved into town two months ago. He lived in Blackwater, and eight years ago his sister Jane went missing on her way home from school. She vanished without a trace. So kidnapping is a possible motive. The Blackwater sheriff conducted a full investigation. Again, the FBI was involved, but after a few false leads from people who saw her on the day she went missing, the trail ran dry. He has a motive and was in the area. What motive? You'll need more than that to convince me, Kane. I have a motive. Kane took a document out of a file and pushed it across the table. It came to nothing, but his mother put in a complaint against Price for inappropriately touching kids at a birthday party. Jane Stickler was at a party the weekend before she went missing. When Jane disappeared, Price was the FBI's prime suspect. Kane placed a photocopy of a newspaper on the desk. His name is mentioned as a person of interest in the Blackwater News. Jenna sighed. If Jane was at a party, then everyone there would have been investigated. Was Price even at the party? Yeah, and he was questioned and came up clean. The sheriff searched his place and found nothing, but we have vital information the investigation didn't have at the time. More than one man is involved. He could have stashed Jane somewhere else. Okay, we'll need to talk to Stickler. He would have been about 14 at the time and could have waited until he was older to strike. Jenna stared at her notes. I've been looking into Lizzie Harper, one of the cleaners. She has a key to the house and has a motive, too. She served a three-year sentence in juvie for stabbing her abusive father to death almost six years ago. She has a seven-year-old son fathered by him. At the time, the newspaper reports believed others were involved. The court sealed her case files, so all we have to go on is the case book from the initial investigation and reports in the local newspapers. If her father was part of the pedophile ring, she might want to take revenge on predators. Both Harper and Stickler would know the property was vacant. She lifted her gaze. The thing is, how did they lure him to the house? If he was actively looking for a kid, say online, they might have played him at his own game. Kane cleared his throat. The FBI have been active in chat rooms for years to catch pedophiles. It's on TV, and it wouldn't take a genius to act as a kid to lure him there. Yes, you have a point. Jenna raised one eyebrow. But it would be difficult to act as a young teenager. They have their own language. She sighed. They don't get all of their kids online, though, do they? I've read about cases involving family members or close friends. You have to remember, predators are cunning. Kane gripped the arm of the chair with one large hand. They often work or become involved in pastimes that involve children. Price worked as a clown to access kids. Pedophiles gain parents' trust, then move in to groom the kids. One of the most prevalent is the man who befriends a widow or single mom. He pretends to care for the mom and, behind her back, abuses the kids. He becomes the dad they never had, and the kids trust him. Most victims keep quiet because they don't want to be without a dad again, or he threatens to kill their mom. The problem is pedophiles act both alone and in groups, which makes them difficult to catch. I am aware of that, Kane. She tapped her pen on the table. All this leads to the question, why attack Price now? It's been years. What would make Lizzie Harper suddenly be out for Price's blood? Harper works as a housekeeper, so I gather she does the cleanup after kids' parties as well. Wolf's gaze hardened. 
Maybe being molested as a kid than seeing a man acting inappropriately with kids at a birthday party might get her angry enough to kill him. She did kill her father. This would be extreme. Usually people don't want to get involved or think they're being a little too sensitive or are ashamed to report this type of behavior. She swallowed the rising bile. I can't believe people could act so irresponsibly. She glanced back at her notes. Was he the only clown around town? Jenna swept her gaze over the men. No, I checked. Rowley's brown eyes met her own and narrowed. There are usually two clowns who put up the bounce house when we have a festival, which is at least once a month. The kids flock there. More damn clowns. Who owns the bounce house? The town council. Contact them and find out the names of the clowns. Jenna pushed both hands through her hair. She hated this case. Acting in a cold and professional manner when dealing with child violation was proving difficult, especially when Kane and Wolf seethed with anger every time they discussed the case. Knowing Kane would kill on her command, if warranted, without question, was not a responsibility she enjoyed. Didn't you say Zoe mentioned other men? Rowley's pen hovered over his notebook. Do we have any leads on who they might be? Jenna smiled at him. Good question. Her attention moved to Wolf. Did you collect any evidence of the cabin we can use? No. From what I can ascertain, only Price and the girl lived at the cabin. Wolf's pale lashes dropped over his eyes as he flicked through his notes. All the fingerprints are either his or Zoe's. If anyone else came here, they were very careful and wore gloves. I can't understand how the cellar was so spotless. I know it was disgusting in the cage where he kept the child, but it appeared he cleaned the rest of the room recently. The bed in the cellar had freshly laundered sheets, and I could smell bleach on a plastic undersheet. Considering the rest of the house is a pigsty, why would he clean the cellar, yet leave her cage filthy? Only one person would know. Kane leaned back in his chair and stretched out his long legs. You'll have to speak to Zoe again, ma'am. I will as soon as I have permission from her parents and clearance from the doctor. But she isn't going to recognize anyone if they wore masks. Jenna tapped her bottom lip with the top of her pen. Perhaps he, I mean Price, didn't clean the room. If he had friends over at the weekends like Zoe told us, perhaps they had concerns about leaving trace evidence. Yeah. Kane's eyes flashed. They wouldn't risk leaving DNA behind, would they? Yet Amos hadn't allowed her to take a shower since his friends left. Jenna made a few notes. Wouldn't you think if he was worried about DNA, he would have made her wash? We'll have to wait for the results from the rape kit samples. Wolf's mouth turned down. The verbal report I received from the doctor at the hospital said Price had abused her over a long period. We know she had been missing for six months, and that would be consistent. He sighed. The only way you'll find out what happened to her is to ask her and see if she'll talk. I find it impossible to believe that Price would only be interested in her on weekends when his friends were there. Jenna's cheeks grew hot. Really? He had his disgusting fetish there for the taking. We know he only gave her a shower before the others arrived. If they cleaned up the place as you suggested, they would have made sure she was clean, too. My guess is the rape kit will implicate Amos Price alone, and I bet his bed will carry the signs as well. I did find seminal fluid in his bed. It will take some time before the DNA tests come back, though. Wolf's gray eyes met Jenna's. I'll let you know the moment they arrive. She pushed to her feet and stared down at him, then moved her attention slowly to Kane. When we find these animals, I expect you to both act in a professional manner. Bring them in so we can interrogate them and see how far this pedophile ring has spread. I don't want to find out they broke their necks resisting arrest. Do you understand? Sure do. Kane's lips formed a thin line. How do you want to proceed? Yeah, hit the streets. Someone must recognize a man with a tattoo resembling a black widow spider on his hand. 
Look at people who run summer camps, scout leaders, preachers, anything that involves kids. Are we looking into the homicide of Amos Price as well? Rowley gave her a concerned look. Or concentrating on the pedophile ring? We'll be running with both cases. She chewed on her bottom lip, thinking. I want to know everything about Lizzie Harper and her mother. But go easy. Kane, contact her mother by phone first and find out what you can. As Wolf mentioned, poison is often a woman's preferred method of killing. We need to know if Lizzie and her mother are involved. And follow up with an interview? Kane was making copious notes in his book. Yes, as soon as possible. Jenna sat back down in her chair. I'm going to see if I can obtain details of Lizzie Harper's case, but it will take a court order, and right now we have nothing on her. I want every piece of information regarding her you can discover. I want to know if anyone else was involved in her abuse apart from her father. She turned her attention to Rowley. Get me a list of tradesmen that the real estate agents used for that house, and go and see Mr. Stickler. Ask him to come in for questioning and watch his reaction. If he looks like he has something to hide, contact Kane for backup. Have you assigned anything for Walters to do to pass the time at the hospital? He has a laptop with him. Kane met her gaze with raised eyebrows, rather than playing solitaire all day. Jenna thought for a moment, then nodded. Yeah, give him a call, would you? I would like him to check the Montana database for any similar cases over the last ten years. Yes, ma'am. When the deputies left, Maggie, the receptionist, knocked on her door, and her huge brown eyes held concern. Can I get you anything, Sheriff? You look plumb worn out. Jenna forced her lip into a smile. I'm fine, thank you. Just overworked. Was there anything else? The new deputies are all settled. They'll drop by later this afternoon. And I thought the day could not get any worse. Jenna slumped into her chair and rubbed her temples. Thanks. Chapter 10 Kane strolled out of Jenna's office and grimaced at Wolf. If the guy with the tattoo is a local, then he would come into town for supplies, or at least eat at Aunt Betty's cafe. I think we should start with the stores in town. Yeah, and we'll work faster if we split up. Wolf scratched his blonde stubble. Although, if you plan to drive out to the Triple Z asking questions, I think I should tag along. The Triple Z was a biker roadhouse some miles out of town, toward the mountains, and not a place to walk into without backup. He grinned at Wolf. Yeah, maybe we should try there first. Nothing brightens my day more than seeing grown men run for cover at the sight of a badge. You saying we intimidate people? Wolf's suntan face creased into a grin. Sometimes looking mean gets results, and over at the Triple Z, we are an unknown quantity. Kane snorted with laughter and headed for the door. We'll take my car. I'll drop you here on the way back. If you take north of town, I'll take south. We'll be able to cover most of the stores and meet at Aunt Betty's for lunch at noon. He reached for his cell phone. I'll call Walters and give him something to do, then we can be on our way. That sounds like a plan. Wolf peered at his cell phone. During the drive, I'll see what I can find on Lizzie Harper and her mother. If you find her number, I'll pull over and speak to her. As Kane negotiated his SUV through the traffic, he wondered why the Black Rock Falls townsfolk celebrated every festival on the calendar, although he imagined visitors from neighboring towns boosted the economy. He rubbed his stomach, glad to find his six-pack not suffering from his overindulgence of homemade cookies and candies he purchased in vast quantities from the stalls lining the streets. The intense morning workouts he performed with Jenna kept him in shape, and her skills had become formidable. After a couple of psychopaths had kidnapped her last winter, she had changed significantly and had worked hard to overcome the flashbacks. Allowing him to train her in mixed martial arts had made them firm friends. They had formed a comfortable relationship and banned talk of work during their downtime together. As he drove, he scanned the area. 
The local park was a mass of color with candy-striped marquees and a bounce house. At the sight of two clowns leading kids on ponies, the hair on the back of his neck stood to attention. He pulled into a parking space. Clowns. He slid his gaze to Wolf. I wonder if they have a union or something. They require a permit and insurance to run pony rides in Black Rock Falls. Wolf's gaze lifted from his phone. We should check the past and present clown permit registrations. We might find if Price had any close friends. I'll have to brush up on city council laws. Yeah, great idea. Keep searching. I'll check them out. He slipped out of the car and strolled toward the line of kids waiting for a ride, tickets in hand. When the clown returned to the starting position, he slapped him on the shoulder. May I have a word? I have kids waiting. The flash of annoyance in the man's amber eyes did not reflect the oversized smile on his white face. Kane led him out of earshot of the kids. It won't take long. He pulled out his notepad and pen. What's your name? Why, I haven't done anything wrong. The clown had a French accent and narrowed his gaze at him. I didn't say you had, but you're working with kids, and in this town, you need a permit and insurance to run a pony ride. Plus, you need to be able to show the permit on request. Kane straightened. Now answer the question. You wouldn't want me to cuff you and drag you down to the sheriff's office in front of the kids, would you? I have a permit. He pulled off a white glove, unzipped his costume, and reached inside. My name is Claude Bouval, and my associate is my brother Pierre. Both names are on the permit. Kane made notes, taking down the names and addresses of the brothers. Where were you this week? It's the fall festival. We are here in the park every day from nine until six. We stay at the Black Rock Falls Motel, and before you ask, no, we didn't leave the motel at any time. We used room service for meals. So, they are in the clear for Price's murder, but still might be in the pedophile ring. Would you please remove your other glove? Why? Claude's eyes opened wide with surprise. I'm investigating an incident involving a clown with a spider tattoo on his hand. Kane narrowed his gaze on the man. Know anyone fitting that description in town? No. Claude removed his other glove. See? No tattoos. Kane glanced up to see the other clown walking toward him. Pierre Bouval? Is something wrong? Show him your hands. Claude gave an exaggerated sigh. He is looking for a clown with a tattoo. Sure. Thierry removed his gloves. No tattoo. Disappointed, Kane tried another angle. Do you know a clown by the name of Amos Price, or the names of clowns who frequent the festivals or who live close by? We don't associate with other entertainers. You see, they are our competition for work. Claude shrugged. Many of them are clowns one day, elves the next. For us, it is a profession not a chance to put on a costume. Although the rodeo clowns are different. I'm not talking about the rodeo clowns, but those who work with children. Ah, I gather one of our profession has acted unprofessionally. Pierre's bright red mouth turned down in an almost comical way. We are aware of child molesters. They ruin our reputation, but it is not always clowns. A magician lured our sister, Angelique, away from a birthday party. She was missing for three days, but managed to get out of the house when the monster was sleeping. He got seven years in jail. Bells and whistles went off in Kane's brain. When did this happen? Eight years ago, in Blackwater. She was only twelve. Pierre's eyes filled with sorrow. She has never been the same, and after years of therapy, she still sleeps with a knife beside her bed. This is why I need to find this man. Kane stared at the men. What was the magician's name? Stuart James McGregor. Thanks. He scribbled in his notebook. Anyone else involved? We don't know. 
Angelique has never spoken to us about her ordeal. When she escaped, a woman walking her dog outside McGregor's house helped her. She took her to the police and was able to identify the house. You live in Blackwater? He did not recognize the address on the permit. Do you live there now? No. We have a place in the Low County, ten miles east of here. We moved there three months ago. We purchased a small ranch from the retired Mayor Rockford. Angelique still lives with our parents in Blackwater. He sighed. Before you ask, we stay in town because our vehicle is being repaired at Miller's Garage if you need to check. Okay, thanks. Kane pulled out his cards and handed them to the men. If you notice a man with a black widow spider tattoo on his hand, call me. If you hear a whisper about anyone working with children acting inappropriately, call me. I'll keep your names out of any inquiry. I just want to catch this guy. When both men took the cards and nodded, Kane strolled back to his vehicle. He slid behind the wheel and turned the key, looking at Wolf. We have another woman who was molested as a child. Her name is Angelique Bouval. The incident happened eight years ago in Blackwater. There would have been a trial. The man charged was Stuart James McGregor. See what you can find out. Do we add her to her suspect list? Kane backed the car into the busy road, then spun the wheel and headed out of town. I think anyone with a motive should be considered. Angelique Bouval became unstable after McGregor kidnapped her, and if she noticed Price acting inappropriately with kids, she could be out for revenge. Well, this is interesting. Wolf's blonde eyebrows rose above the screen of his cell phone. I discovered where McGregor last worked before his arrest and Googled the company. It seems a company by the name of Party Time employs McGregor and Price. The company's main business is supplying acts, clowns, magicians, Santa Claus, and all kinds of characters for kids' parties and for festivals in at least three local towns, including here and Blackwater. I've checked out the list of employees on their website against the Sexual Offenders Register, and they all come up clean apart from McGregor. He held up the screen of his cell phone. See, Stu McGregor is still listed as available in a limited-capacity street license entertainment. Only no kids' parties. He is a low-risk sexual offender. I doubt he gets much work. That's interesting. Yeah, and I have Rosemary Harper's number. Wolf glanced at him. Want to speak to her now? Yeah. He pulled the car to the side of the road and took Wolf's phone. A woman answered after a couple of rings. Am I speaking to Rosemary Harper? Good. This is Deputy Kane from the Black Rock Falls Sheriff's Department. I need to ask you a few things in the strictest of confidence. He asked her a few questions, then disconnected and handed back the cell phone. That is too crazy to explain right now. I'll fill you in after I've run it past the sheriff. He turned the SUV back onto the highway and accelerated. Sure. Wolf took the phone and smiled at him. I do understand the term confidential. About five minutes out of town, Kane turned the SUV into the parking lot of the Triple Z bar and pulled into a space. He turned in his seat and stared at the cell phone. I wonder how many of the men working at party time have priors. I'll check them out the moment we get back to the office. From what we know about Price, he didn't work alone. It's more than likely he has been doing this for a long time and could have also been involved in the Angelique Bouval kidnapping, but she only mentioned one man, Stu McGregor. It is something we have to consider as they work together and were both pedophiles. Kane opened the car door. He would have worked the festivals here and in Blackwater. Miss Bouval might have caught sight of him in costume, and it triggered a memory, although his type of murder takes a lot of planning. She could have identified him years ago, and she's had years to plan his murder. Wolf snorted. It's not something a person gets over easy. Kane led the way into the Triple Z and strolled up to the bar. In his peripheral vision, he noticed men slipping out the back door and smiled to himself. He had bigger fish to fry. What can I get for you? 
The man behind the counter rubbed a filthy rag over the bar, avoiding his gaze. Information, Kane straightened. Do you have a customer with a black widow tattoo on his hand? If I did, I wouldn't tell you. The barman snorted in disgust. We don't rat on our friends. Okay, I'll take a look for myself. Kane turned and glanced over the room. He moved closer to Wolf. Split up and take a look. I doubt we'll find anything. After moving through the eight men in the bar, they returned to the vehicle and found a woman wearing tight cut-off jeans, a shirt that left nothing to the imagination, and red stilettos leaning against the door. Kane touched his hat. Do you want to speak to me, ma'am? You asked about a black widow tattoo. Yeah. Do you know the name of the man who has one? Nothing's free. She pushed out her chest and winked at him. Fifty bucks. Kane barked out a laugh. Twenty. He slid a bill from his wallet and dangled it in the air. Take it or leave it. Okay. Some years ago, maybe as long as six, a biker gang called the Black Widows used to come here from Blackwater. They all had those tattoos on their hands. She pointed one red-tipped fingernail between her thumb and first finger. Right here. But I haven't seen any of them for years. She plucked the twenty out of Kane's fingers, then turned and sashayed away. Kane rubbed his chin and stared after her. It seems every clue we have leads to Blackwater. Chapter 11 She strolled in the park, and to all around her, she would appear to be one of the crowd eating cotton candy and enjoying the festivities. The smell of hot dogs and horse manure filled the air as she lingered at the pony rides. She had seen Deputy Kane chatting to the clowns earlier. He had given them his card and smiled, then scurried away. She had stared after him, and a shiver of hate ran through her. He could be one of the monsters. A man in a position of power with someone no one would ever expect. He had no wife and never dated. That made him a prime candidate. Maybe she would follow him for a while and see what he was doing in town today. I can see you, Deputy Kane and I'm watching you. She needed an excuse to move into the pony circle to keep Kane in sight, and sidled closer to a clown lifting a child onto a small bay pony. Touching the horse's mane, she feigned interest. How long will you be here? I would love to bring my little sister for a pony ride. She just adores clowns. For the entire festival. The clown had a French accent. Oh. Thank you. She smiled warmly. We always had clowns for my sister's birthday parties. Do you do kids' parties? Sometimes, but we prefer the festivals. He indicated to the line of kids waiting for rides. I gotta go. Oh, yes, of course. She smiled, but inside her skin crawled. Her attention fixed on Kane. She walked slowly back through the crowd and took a seat on the far side of the pony rides beside a frazzled mother with three demanding children. From here, she could keep a close eye on Kane's movements. When he headed for his car, she got to her feet, intent on following him. She needed to know what he was doing and who he had on his list of suspects. As she walked to her vehicle, she glanced at her watch. Goosebumps rose on her arms with a thrill of anticipation. Soon she would meet the next monster on her list. He had been such an easy man to catch. She had played him at his own game, fed his ego, and the jerk had agreed to meet her. By the morning, another monster would be dead. Chapter 12 Jenna lifted her attention to the two new deputies, 
Cole Weber, 28, with brown hair and brown eyes, introduced himself with a soft New England accent. He had transferred to Black Rock Falls from Boston, and having another experienced deputy would be useful. Standing, she took in the man before her, noting his confidence. She offered her hand. Welcome to Black Rock Falls. Do take a seat. I'm glad to be here, ma'am. She turned her attention to Paula Bradford, 5'7", with blonde hair and green eyes. This rookie had started her career in law enforcement only six months previously in Helena. It's a big step for you to leave your family and come here. She shook the woman's hand. I come from a large family, and solitude in a small town will be heaven, ma'am. Paula smiled, then sat down. Thank you for arranging the accommodation. My apartment is very nice. Yes, thank you, Weber gave her a strange look. Although I gather from the neighbor the house once belonged to a deputy killed in the line of duty. Jenna cleared her throat. Yes, Pete Daniels was a valued member of our team, but he wasn't killed in the house, and his family donated the property to the department. Are his killers in jail? They're dead. Jenna's mind flashed back to the crunch of bone as her heel killed her attacker. A knife held at her throat, the discharge of a weapon, and blood on her face. Her hands trembled at the disturbing memory, and she bunched them into fists. Jenna? Kane's worried voice broke through the terrifying visions playing in a loop in her mind. She blinked, and seeing him filling the doorway, noticed the confused expressions on her new deputy's faces. Oh, God, how long have I been out this time? Forcing the horrific memories back into their box, she forced her lips into a smile. Deputy Kane, I'd like you to meet Cole Weber and Paula Bradford. They will be starting tomorrow. I'll need everyone pulling overtime this weekend. Can you ask Wolf to bring them up to speed? I'd like an update from you as soon as you're finished. Yes, ma'am. I've spoken to Rosemary Harper. Kane's concerned gaze moved over her face as he placed a takeout cup of coffee and a paper sack from Aunt Betty's cafe on her desk. I picked up your lunch. She glanced at the clock. It was past two. Thanks. I've been busy. She glanced at her two new deputies. See you in the morning. When the door closed, Jenna covered her face with both hands. The flashbacks of her kidnapping and near death had lessened, but obviously sat in the back of her subconscious waiting to pounce at any given moment. She felt such a fool, acting like an idiot in front of her new deputies, but Kane would cover for her. He had been her rock throughout the entire ordeal. She leaned back in her seat and sipped her coffee, then peeked into the bag and smiled. Turkey on rye, her favorite. She took a bite and the door opened. Kane walked back in and dropped into a chair. Swallowing, she smiled at him. Thank you. I didn't notice the time. Are you okay, Jenna? She waved his question away. Fine. We were discussing Pete's death, and I had a flashback. I hope it didn't last too long. I don't think so. Kane's lips twitched into a half-smile. Weber thought you were grief-stricken discussing Pete's death and feels like a heel for bringing up the subject. I know we are all sorry about what happened to Pete, but you really need to see someone about the flashbacks and nightmares. Post-traumatic stress disorder isn't a myth. It needs to be treated. You can talk. The other night during the movie, you dozed off and woke up and grabbed me by the throat, if you remember. That was a nightmare, not PTSD. Kane grinned at her. I wasn't in Afghanistan. I was defending you against a zombie. I shouldn't watch shows with zombies. Next time you want to come over to watch a movie, I'm picking it, okay? Sure. She sucked the mayonnaise from her fingers and looked at him. Forget movies for a minute. What else did you find out today? Kane gave her the details of the clown's sister the party-time connection between McGregor and Price, and his visit to the Triple Z Bar. We checked about half of the local businesses and asked the waitresses at Aunt Betty's Cafe. Susie Hartwig came up with someone with a tattoo. 
She danced with a blonde man at the rodeo dance last summer with a similar tattoo, but she can't recall anything else. She thinks she's seen him in town. She said he was rough and smelly. He had strange eyes. I tried to push her to give me a more detailed description, but she only said he was around 50 and had a beer belly. Okay, that's a start. Jenna heaved a sigh. I couldn't get into the sealed files of Lizzie Harper's court case, so I have zip. I have another bit of information. Kane's eyebrows furrowed. I called Rosemary Harper and told her we were investigating a case similar to her daughter's and needed her help. She backed away at first, but when I mentioned more than one man appeared to be involved, she opened up. She recently discovered her husband is not the father of Lizzie's son. The kid became ill a year ago and has a genetic disease. The doctor performed a DNA test, and the kid has a different father. As Lizzie refuses to tell anything about her ordeal, apart from a few sketchy details, her mother believes this is proof she was subject to more than one man's abuse. That's frightening. She nibbled at her sandwich. Anything else? Since killing her father, Lizzie is under treatment and on medication for behavioral problems. I can place her in the area during the time we have for Price's death. The Harpers live one block away from the crime scene. Jenna sighed. All circumstantial. I need proof. I don't have proof, but a theory. Many people in town use the Harper's cleaning service for kids' parties, and it is reasonable to assume they would run into the entertainment. It's possible, and as Price's contact details are online, maybe Lizzie pretended to be a kid he'd met as a clown and asked him to meet her at the house. Jenna nodded. It's feasible. She did have a master key to the house, but how did she lure him there? Would she know about those online chat rooms you mentioned? Yeah, if she watched TV, I'm sure she would be aware of the danger of chat rooms for kids. His brow creased. It's common knowledge predators pretend to be kids online. There are so many groups on Facebook alone, and the FBI can't monitor them all. She would just use a come-get-me username, and they would flock to her. Jenna sipped her coffee and observed him over the rim. The problem is widespread. I researched the frequency of cases today, and there are literally thousands ongoing in the state. It's like an epidemic. As a shadow darkened her doorway, she glanced up to see Rowley. Yes? I have Mr. Stickler in the interview room. Rowley's eyebrows rose. He came in without a problem, but seems a little confused about why you want to speak to him. He walked toward the desk and placed a sheet of paper in front of her. Here is the list of tradespeople the real estate agency uses for the property they manage. The ones highlighted are those who worked at the crime scene. He met her gaze. Another thing I found interesting, the properties owned by Rockford were all rentals and managed by the agency. The same master key accesses them all. The cleaning service has one of the keys, and so does Stickler. Okay, thanks. She glanced at Kane and stood. I'll add that info to the whiteboard now and add it to the case file later. We need to speak to Mr. Stickler without delay. She scribbled on the whiteboard, then hurried from the room. In the interview room, Stickler sat hands clasped on the table and looking nervous. The smell of sweat drifted toward Jenna as she entered the room. Stickler, in his early twenties, was lean and muscular. Jenna sat down and smiled at him. Thank you for coming in. This is Deputy Kane. She waved a hand toward him. Do you mind if we record the interview? What's this all about? Stickler's expression was grim. I haven't done anything wrong. He brushed at the beating sweat on his upper lip with trembling fingers. Okay, record the interview. But I want it known you haven't read me my rights. You sure look like you have something to hide. She turned on the recorder. I haven't arrested you, Mr. Stickler. This is just a friendly chat. If I did arrest you, then I would read you your rights. What you tell us today would not be admissible in court. She smiled. For the record, it is 2.30, and in the room with Mr. Adam Stickler is Sheriff Jenna Alton and Deputy David Kane. Mr. Stickler has volunteered to speak to us today. 
She glanced at her notes, then lifted her gaze to Stickler. Miss Allison Saunders from the real estate office discovered the body of a man in the house at Three Maple Lane. I gather you did some work there recently. A body? Anyone I know? The color drained from his face. Just answer the question. Kane crossed his arms across his wide chest and glared at him. Yeah? I had to attach new handles to the kitchen cabinets. I finished last week on Friday morning. Jenna leaned forward. Were you there before the cleaners? I mean, did the place look as if it had been cleaned prior to an inspection? Nope. I was there before the cleaners. Miss Saunders told me to be out of there by noon. I left around eleven. Can you account for your movements between Friday last week and Wednesday of this week? Yeah. I worked Saturday over at Blindman's Peak on old Mr. Starkey's roof. I was there all day. Spent Sunday with my folks. Monday through Thursday, I went back to finish Mr. Starkey's roof. Stickler eyed her with suspicion, took out his cell phone, and scrolled through the screen. I can give you the numbers and you can check. Jenna took down the numbers. Do you know a man by the name of Amos Price? Nope. Stickler stared at her, and a small shadow of doubt crossed his eyes. Just a minute. Yeah, I do know that name. I'm pretty sure he is the clown my parents hired for my sister's birthday parties when we lived in Blackwater. He narrowed his gaze. I'm the eldest of seven. Six girls and me. Yeah, that's him. He was found dead in the house on Maple. Kane rubbed the dark stubble on his chin. Are you aware Amos Price was a pedophile? No! A look of anguish crossed Stickler's face. Sweet Jesus! Do you think he was involved with my sister's disappearance? Jenna filled a glass with water and pushed it toward him. I'm not sure. Did you know your mother filed a complaint against him for inappropriate behavior? No. I only remember the cops coming when Jane went missing. I guess they investigated him. I have no idea. I was just a kid. Okay. Jenna leaned back in her chair, acting nonchalant. He was getting way too upset. Was it genuine or an act to cover his guilt? How long ago did your sister vanish? Eight years. Stickler lifted his red-rimmed eyes and sniffed. If he's dead... We'll never find her now, will we? He took the glass and gulped the water. Our job is to find her, and we'll do our very best, but we need your help. What we want to know is if Price had any friends. Kane's expression hardened. Do you remember if he worked with another clown, or did you see him with anyone? Yeah, I do remember a magician. Called himself the Great Dungini and another clown. Stickler stared into space, then moved his gaze back to Kane. I don't remember any other names. He straightened. I could ask my parents. They probably have photographs. They took tons and have video of the parties, although it would be hard to identify them with the clown makeup. Okay, thanks. You've been very helpful. And any images or videos would be a great help. Interview terminated at 2.50. Jenna switched off the recorder. Deputy Kane will give you his card. If you can think of anything at all to help us, please call him. I will. Stickler pocketed the card. Can I go now? Yes. Jenna flicked her ID over the scanner on the door, and it clicked open. She indicated toward Rowley. My deputy will show you out. After shutting the door behind him, she turned to Kane. What do you think? From his reaction at finding out Price is dead, he isn't the killer. Kane shrugged. Problem is, he is angry and believes his sister is still alive, which after so many years the chances are remote. He has confirmed there was another clown. Stu McGregor, the great Dungini, and Price worked together at one time, and we know they worked at party time. As Price was clean at the time of the FBI investigation, I figure the media would have gotten hold of McGregor's case, and if Stickler knew the two men worked together, he might have suggested Price had taken his sister. 
I hope Stickler doesn't think McGregor is involved as well and seek vengeance. Oh, I hope not, Jenna frowned. We have enough to worry about at the moment. Chapter 13 It could not have been easier to turn the tables on the next predator. With a few concerned words about having to slip away from home once her parents were asleep, she convinced him to take a room at the Black Rock Falls Motel. A perfect place. The motel had a variety of clientele, depending on the seasons, from randy rodeo cowboys having one-night stands to hockey fans supporting their favorite team. In other words, the room rate started at two hours, and the owner accepted every client who walked through the door. Men like him loved motel rooms because they carried so much DNA, proving anything would be difficult. She persuaded him to leave the room key buried under the big tree beside the school gate, and she made plans to meet him inside the room at seven that evening. After watching him drop the key and kick dirt over it, she waited for his SUV to turn the corner before attempting to collect it. As she walked past the school, she allowed oranges to spill from a paper sack in her arms. Retrieving the key and popping it into the sack with the oranges had been easy. After arriving home that evening, she checked her messages, made a few necessary calls, then turned into a young teenager. She glanced in the mirror. At a slim five-foot-two with fried eggs for breasts, she could pass as a much younger girl from a distance. During the day, the heels on her shoes and the clever way she styled her hair made her appear at least five-seven. Her padded bra gave her a more voluptuous look— and when she added makeup, she looked all of her 21 years. After slipping on surgical gloves, she pulled on a hoodie and moved through her kitchen and into the garage. She had chosen a mid-range white Ford, with so many in town, nobody would notice her parking on the tree-lined lane beside the motel. The Black Rock Falls Motel was in a perfect location. No CCTV cameras to intrude on clients' privacy and the owners left them alone. Spectacular burnished copper maple trees surrounding the courtyard bathed the area in mottled shadows, which would allow her to enter the room unnoticed. She arrived at 6.30 and slid from the car, leaving the car keys hidden on top of one of the wheels, then, keeping to the shadows, entered the motel parking lot. The monster had followed her instructions, taking a room at the back of the building, the last one closest to the trees. Glancing around, she jogged across the courtyard and used the key to gain entrance. She heaved a sigh of relief, finding the room unoccupied. If he was a pack animal, she would be in trouble if he arrived with a couple of his friends. She removed her coat, then took the long metal meat skewer out of her bag and slid it with an easy reach beneath the pillow. No poison this time. This one deserved special treatment. Glancing at the clock, she turned out the lights and watched out the window for him to arrive. At five minutes to seven, an SUV pulled up outside, and she caught sight of the light glistening on his bald head as he walked to the door. Her heart pounded. He was big and could snap her neck like a twig. Virtually defenseless, she would be at his mercy if her plan failed. When he pushed open the door, she backed into the bathroom, standing silhouetted by the streetlight coming through the bathroom window. To make him believe his date was a young girl, she must keep her face in shadow. A wave of anticipation at the thought of destroying this monster empowered her. She would play the role and make him pay. You in here? His voice sounded excited and shrill for his size. She sucked in a deep breath to calm herself, then giggled. They always liked it when she giggled. Yes, I'm here. Did you bring the things I asked you to buy? Yeah. He held up a paper sack. Why the stockings and blindfold? I don't want you wearing stockings. I like my girls natural. 
Can I turn the light on so I can see you a bit better? You sure look pretty. Not yet. I'm shy. She twirled fingers in her hair, acting coy, and kept out of his way. You look older than your picture. I thought you were eighteen. I shave my head to look older. He gave her a sad look. I did lie a bit, but I wanted to meet you. That's okay, she giggled again. You like to play games, right? Oh, yeah. I like to play games. What do you have in mind? I watched my sister with her boyfriend. She's 18. When they were babysitting and I thought I was asleep, I asked you to bring those things because I want to do what they were doing. That sounds like fun. What were they doing? Well, my sister tied his hands and feet to the bed with stockings. Then she blindfolded him. She giggled again at his moan of pleasure. Then she climbed on top of him. It looked like fun. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. His voice trembled as he shed his clothes, then dragged the items out of the bag. He ripped open a condom packet and smiled at her. Why don't you get undressed, then come here and tie me up? Sickened by his lustful gaze, she shook her head. Blindfold first. I'm shy. We can play your game next time, okay? Sure. I have lots of games we can play. He pulled the blindfold in place and laid back on the bed. This is going to be so much fun. I can't wait. She bent, retrieved his balled-up smelly socks, and dropped them on the bed, then turned on the radio, nice and loud. I don't want anyone listening. Good idea. She moved swiftly, tying his ankles, then straddling his fat belly to secure his wrists to the slats in the headboard. His heavy breathing and moans of encouragement made her skin crawl. She slid the metal skewer from under the pillow. Satisfied he was restrained, she leaned over to switch on the bedside lamp, then lifted up his blindfold. Look at me. An expression of terror crossed his face, and he trembled. Who the hell are you? He bucked, frantically trying to dislodge her. Are you a cop? I don't think so. I'm here to kill you. She pressed down hard on his chest, feeling his heart thumping against her palms, and stared into his horrified eyes. How does it feel knowing you're going to die? Not if I kill you first, bitch. Good luck. Her fear slipped away as she looked at the pathetic excuse for a man shaking beneath her. She could not pity him. She hated men like him. I'm going to kill you in the most painful way possible, just like I killed your friend. Why? His face had turned a deep shade of red. Suddenly, struck dumb, she stared at him. Why? For all the young girls you molested. Payback is a bitch, isn't it? She enjoyed his struggle beneath her and the way his eyes bulged. She had frightened him, the same way as he terrified his victims. Your friend died slowly, but unfortunately for you, it will be quicker but so much more painful. You don't need to kill me. I'll give you money, anything. Tears welled in his eyes. What do you want? justice. She picked up the socks. Open your mouth. To her surprise, he complied, and she jammed the socks halfway down his throat, then pressed down hard. She sucked in a deep breath, then plunged the skewer into his ear. As his muffled screams filled the room, she felt nothing. No remorse, no pity for inflicting incredible agony on the writhing man. Her mind was a void. 
He was vermin, and she was the exterminator. She leaned down and stared into his eyes as the life faded away. Suck it up. When he shuddered and his eyes rolled up displaying the whites, she removed the skewer, then wiped it on the pillow. After dropping it into a plastic bag, she pulled out a roll of tape and dabbed a strip meticulously over the bed, lifting a myriad of hairs from the sheet. Satisfied nothing of her remained, she emptied his wallet to make it look like a robbery, then collected her things and slipped out the door. Rot in hell. Chapter 14 Saturday Early the next morning, after their usual workout, Kane sat in Jenna's kitchen drinking coffee. The bloodhound sat at his feet. One call to the animal shelter had revealed his name as Duke, and the dog he thought to be old turned out to be five and listed as a great tracker. After rehydrating, a couple of decent meals, and a bath, he was looking good. He smiled at Jenna. I hope I can find time to purchase the horses tomorrow. They might come in useful in this investigation. He leaned back in his seat. I repaired the corral last night, and the horse boxes in the barn are perfect. All I need to do is order feed and straw. He frowned. There are a couple of horse trailers for sale in town as well. Isn't this going to cost you a lot of money? She peered at him over the coffee cup. I mean, you have spent a fortune on meat for Duke, more than you spend on yourself, and his vet bill must be horrendous. He grinned at her and patted Duke on the head. Nah, it's all good, and I have money. There was no way I was sending Duke back to the shelter, especially as he is a tracker. He will be a great asset once I get him fit. I like his company, and I'm sure you'll grow to love him. He has such a sad face. Of course I love him. I just hope his name won't offend Deputy Duke Walters. He chuckled and called the dog to his side. Nah, I told him and he said he was used to it. Apparently Duke is a popular name for hound dogs. Her cell phone vibrated on the table. Sheriff Alton. Yes, Mr. Ricker, what is your emergency? She glanced at him, disbelief etched in her expression. Don't touch anything. Shut the door to the room and keep Rosa in your office until we arrive. I'll have someone there as soon as possible. She disconnected and the next moment was speaking to Rowley. Can you get over to the Black Rock Falls Motel? Hold the fort until we get there. The cleaner found a body tied to one of the beds. Secure the scene until we arrive. I'm contacting Wolf now. Kane pushed to his feet. I'll contact Wolf. You get ready for work. Okay, then go to the motel straight away. Don't wait for me. She gave him a wistful look. Why do people seem to die on my day off? Dumb luck. He headed for the door, then stopped and glanced back at her. Would you like me to handle this case? The second death in one week? No way. I need to be at ground zero. Jenna shook her head, sending her raven hair spilling in all directions. I hope it's not another homicide. I'm worried Black Rock Falls is becoming murder central. Within half an hour, Kane pulled his black SUV into the motel parking lot beside Wolf's vehicle with the Black Rock Falls coroner insignia on the side. When Rowley walked out of the office to meet him, his face pale and expression grim, Kane took him to one side. What do we have? Homicide. Rowley's brown eyes narrowed. There is a guy in one of the rooms around back tied to the bed with stockings and with blood running out of his ear. Wolf is there now. He said to send you down when you arrive. He glanced over Kane's shoulder. Ah, there's Sheriff Alton now. Have you taken statements from Mr. Ricker and Rosa? I assume she found the body when she went to clean the room. Yeah, the room was booked yesterday. Ricker thought it was for a romantic evening. Most people take this side of the motel if they don't want to be seen. The SUV parked outside belongs to Eli Dorsey. Kane made a note in his book. I see. Any other customers staying on this side of the motel? Nope. 
and Ricker said apart from Dorsey's vehicle, he hadn't seen any other vehicles parked here, but Rosa was on her way home and noticed a white late model sedan parked on the road some ways back. She said it was unusual to see a car there because the trees dropped berries all over the paintwork. Rowley lifted his chin. She said the car was gone this morning when she arrived to clean the rooms. Did she say what time she noticed the car? Around seven last night. Rowley cleared his throat. She works two shifts, early morning and six until nine at night. Kane scratched his cheek, thinking. Do you know what time the victim arrived? He picked up the key before lunch and paid for the night. I used the mapping app on my phone and located his cabin in the mountains. It is about a mile away from the last victim's residence. It's possible they knew each other, but folks up in the mountains keep to themselves. Rowley removed his hat and scraped a hand through his unruly hair. Ricker said Dorsey did say he was in town for the fall festival. I wonder if the two dead men knew each other. Kane rubbed his chin. Hang on a minute. Eli Dorsey. Holy shit. I'm sure I saw that name on the list of employees at party time. He might have worked with our last victim. He glanced at Jenna as she joined them. What have we got? Jenna moved to his side. Another homicide, ma'am. He booked in here under the name of Eli Dorsey. I'm wondering if he is the same man who works for party time. That's pretty simple to find out. I'll check online. The sheriff gave them both an exasperated look, pulled out her cell phone, and located the webpage for party time. Yeah, there is a clown here of the same name. That's him, all right. His photo matches his driver's license. She snorted. Maybe someone is doing us a favor. Kane regarded her closely. She appeared agitated to the max. What do you mean? Oh, come on, Kane. She glared at him. Zoe said four men visited her. If Eli Dorsey was one of them, then someone is doing our job for us. Her eyes flashed with anger. Trust me, angry people take the law into their own hands. Someone who suffered abuse could have discovered these men hurting children, and they would not want to put a kid through a trial. Ask any brutalized woman. She would rather see the perpetrator dead so they never harm anyone again. When the men who attacked me died, I felt nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing but relief. I'm sure most women would agree with you. Most men, too. Kane huffed out a long sigh. Jenna pressed long fingers to both temples. If someone knows the names of the molesters, they could be taking revenge against them. It would be impossible for Zoe to identify Eli because the men wore masks. I suggest we target his associates anyway and find out if they're involved. If we can find them before they're murdered, Rowley's brown gaze dropped to the ground. The mountain men are a pretty tight bunch. They won't rat on each other. Maybe things will change when they discover Eli was murdered as well. They'll be running scared. Jenna lifted her chin, and a determined look crossed her face. Pedophiles like them young, but the killer probably isn't a kid. So he could be chasing down a close relative hell-bent on vengeance. If a pedophile ring is operating in our town, we need to close it down. It looks like I'll need to make another call to the FBI. They had nothing on price. Kane shrugged. I've checked, and he wasn't on any sex offenders list or had any priors statewide. Now he is dead. They have no case to pursue. But I'll keep them informed. Jenna gave an exasperated sigh. They do have ongoing investigations statewide at the moment, and with any luck, the other men in the pedophile ring will drop into their net. Kane shook his head. With the Internet, it could be operating anywhere in the country. Finding who is involved will take a heck of a long time. Then we walk all over their friends until one of them talks. Someone must know something about these men. People gossip, although I gather predators often keep their predilections secret. Jenna shot him an angry look. They work together. There has to be another link. Someone knows both of them. Find them. Kane wanted to soothe her agitation and lowered his voice. We are all working around the clock on this, Jenna. I know. 
but I want results. Jenna pushed a hand through her hair and glared at Rowley. Which room? The victim is this way, ma'am. Rowley's face paled as he led the way. This homicide is different from the last one. Right. Jenna's shoulders slumped as she glanced at Kane. Have you been on scene yet? Nope. I just arrived. Kane grabbed his crime scene bag from the back seat of his SUV and headed toward the room. Wolf is working it now. The motel room door was open when they arrived. Kane dropped his bag outside, and they suited up in crime scene gear. He surveyed the area. If I plan to murder someone, this place is perfect. No CCTV cameras, trees to give cover. No one has a chance of seeing anyone coming and going. Murder or a place for illicit sex with a minor? Jenna's forehead creased into a frown. As the killer didn't book the room or pick up the key, Eli must have snuck his murderer into the parking lot in his car. Or the killer came in that white sedan. Kane peered into the door and nodded to Wolf. Tied to the bed, the naked victim was wearing a condom and had a gag of some sort pushed into his mouth. A blindfold covered his forehead. The man's face had turned a deep shade of blue. Sex play gone wrong? No, I don't think so. This is a homicide, and we can add robbery as well. His wallet is empty. Wolf's eyes peered at him over his face mask. Okay, let me take a look. Jenna shot him an inquisitive look and peered inside the door. Oh, I see. What have you found in his personal effects? Is there anything to tie him to the price case? Yes and no. Wolf strolled to the door with a grocery sack and held it open for her. Chocolates and wine. Condoms. His wallet and clothes are here. No cash. It could have been a hooker, but if so, she wore gloves. I've found no prints other than the victims on his wallet. There are hundreds of others. Far too many to consider. Hookers don't generally murder their clients. It's bad for business. They don't wear gloves, either. Jenna sighed. Any initial findings? He has a scar on his right side that fits the description Zoe gave you of one of her attackers. But appendix operation scars are quite common. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think the killer stabbed him in his ear with something like a knitting needle. I'll give you a definitive cause of death after the autopsy. He sighed. Doing something like that would be taking BDSM a little too far. But as our victim was obviously expecting sex and his wallet is empty, I suggest we look at the local hookers. I don't think so. Jenna cleared her throat. I'm not aware of any who do call-outs. They all work discreetly at the Cattleman's Hotel. In my time here, we have not been able to find cause to charge one of them. I've never been able to prove they accept money for sex. She chewed in the end of her pen. This murder is far more complex. We know this man was a clown and worked at party time with Amos Price. We have no indication to suggest he was involved in the pedophile ring unless Zoe can identify him. If she does, then we could have a vigilante situation. Suggestions? She lifted her concerned blue gaze to Kane. Two murders in a week. I'm not ruling out the possibility just yet. Kane cleared his throat. If he is an associate of Price, then I would agree. The killer could have staged the murder to keep us guessing. And it may not be related to Price's murder at all. I'll be interested in what Wolf discovers during the autopsy. Jenna gave Kane an agitated look. Suspects? That depends. Kane flipped through his notes. If we take the vigilante killer angle for now and include women molested as kids, Lizzie Harper and Angelique Bouval fit the profile. 18 to, say, 25. Unstable due to kidnapping or other traumatic event involving a man. We have to take into account these men traveled around and could have molested kids in other towns. It's not unreasonable to believe one of the suspects traveled here to kill them. You mean the killer was molested by them as a kid and is seeking revenge as an adult? Jenna tapped her bottom lip, thinking, Yeah, that makes sense. Kane glanced at Rowley. 
We need information from as long as 10 years ago. Do you remember anything similar happening in town when you were a kid? Yeah, I do. There is someone else in Black Rock Falls we should consider. Rowley's head bobbed. Yeah, I remember a couple of years back hearing about one of the teachers at the elementary school having a breakdown caused by some trauma as a kid. I'm not sure what happened. She still works here, but it's common knowledge she hates men. Kane took out his notepad. You got a name? Yeah, Miss McCarthy. I think her name is Patricia or Patty. I'm not sure where she lives, but I figure she will have a house near Stanton Forest by the college. All the teachers seem to live in that area. I hear she rarely leaves the house unless it is to teach the young kids. Okay, good work. Jenna's expression brightened. Rowley, I want you to head back to the office. Open a case file for this victim and log the interviews of the motel owner and the woman who found the body. That's a priority. After that, continue to search for cases involving child molestation or disappearance here and in other counties. Go back 8 to 15 years. Get Bradford and Walters involved in the search. Split up the counties. It will be quicker. Any cats peeing on cars or domestics that come in today, send out Weber. He is experienced enough to handle the smaller cases without supervision. She took a breath, then blew it out, making her bangs fly off her forehead. I'll drop my car at the office, then I'm heading up the mountain again with Kane to check out the victim's residence. We might find some evidence to link him to the pedophile ring. Yes, ma'am. Rowley touched his hat and jogged to his cruiser. Kane rubbed the back of his neck. With potentially two more pedophiles on the list, if Zoe's account is correct, we'll need to find out who else is involved before the killer strikes again. Yeah. Jenna raised one black eyebrow. I guess we'd better bring in the clowns. Chapter 15 Jenna chewed her fingertips in frustration. Her long-awaited day to relax had slipped into oblivion. She sipped takeout coffee and watched the countryside dash by as Kane's SUV burned up the miles. The beauty of Montana was inspirational. So many different vistas, from lush pine forests to dazzling mountain views that went on forever. She liked the people, and overall, life was perfect— until a killer wandered into her town and shattered the peace. The road ahead narrowed, and rocks tumbled down the mountainside, pinging against the doors as they drove past. Although Kane had slowed the car, a rush of fear rolled over her. The narrow dirt trail fell away to a deep ravine on one side, and the impenetrable pine trees on the other gave no space to get off the road if another car approached— as the back wheels of the SUV slid, trying to gain traction, and peppered the trees with rocks, Kane's concerned gaze moved over her. You're as white as a sheet. You okay? She gripped the seat. Keep your eyes on the road. I'm fine. Don't worry. I'm used to driving in these conditions. My vehicle won't slide down the mountain. I promise. He flashed her a white smile. Well, not on the way up, anyway. The way down, we might slip a bit. He chuckled and tapped the GPS screen. The cabin is just around the next bend. She gave him her best sarcastic look. I'm so thrilled. They turned down a wider road that had not seen a grater for a long time. Someone had placed planks of wood over the deep ruts, and the dry wood creaked and groaned as they edged forward. The cabin. A small, roughly built log structure with a front porch had a rusty water tank attached to one side. A pile of firewood, complete with an axe sticking out of a cutting log, appeared to have been there since settlement. Jenna gaped in amazement. People actually live in that hovel? Seems so. Kane pulled the SUV to a halt. People like to drop off the grid and live up here, so it's not fancy. She pointed to the roof. Good Lord, is that a satellite dish? All the perks with none of the comfort. Yep, yeah, 
And now the communications tower is perched on top of the mountain. Their phone and Wi-Fi would be better than most are getting in town. He glanced at her. Shall I take the lead, ma'am? She liked the way he deferred to her seniority on the job. It had taken him some time to adjust to not being in charge. Although he gave her the utmost respect, sometimes she could almost see him chomping at the bit to take the lead. She handed him a pair of gloves, then pulled on her own. Yes, go ahead. Standing back to allow Kane to lead the way, she waited for him to hammer on the door and announce their arrival. When no response came, she used the key Wolf had found with the body and pushed open the door. Sheriff's Department, is anyone there? Jenna heard a sound like the clanking of chains and ducked away from the door, pressing her back to the rough log wall. What was that? He might have left his dog chained up in there. Kane did a turkey peek into a window, looked at her, and shook his head. Is anyone there? A slight shuffling sound came from within the silence. The wind howled through the trees, making the hair on the back of Jenna's neck stand on end. She moved closer to Kane. Be careful. A shotgun blast would go straight through these walls. Roger that. Kane dropped down low to the ground and eased his way to the door. The trees creaked, and the breeze sent leaves spiraling around their feet. Jenna dropped her voice to a whisper. I'm sure someone is inside. I can hear floorboards creaking. Unless you want me to open fire, I suggest you call out. Kane edged closer to the front stoop. You have three seconds, and I'm coming in. Don't shoot! Jenna bit her lip at the sound of a terrified female voice. It's okay. We won't hurt you. Come out with your hands up. I can't. A sob followed. I'm chained to the wall. Holy mother of God. Kane's astonished glance met hers. Let me take this, Jenna. Her first instinct was to protest, but Kane could shoot the feelers off an ant. She nodded. Okay, watch my back. He moved through the door, glock in hand. Are you alone? Yes. Jenna kept her back to the wall, and Kane's footsteps thundered through the small cabin as he checked every room. Clear. His voice repeated the word as he moved through each room in the house. Jenna stepped inside and gaped at the skinny teenage girl face pale and with black circles under her eyes. The girl wore nothing but a long, tattered T-shirt bearing the name of a local beer manufacturer. In her periphery, she noticed Kane dragging a blanket out of a cupboard and heading her way. She took the blanket from him and walked toward the girl. I'm Sheriff Jenna Alton from Black Rock Falls, and this is Deputy Kane. You're safe now. What's your name? She draped the blanket over the girl's shoulders. Jane Stickler. She glanced fearfully at the open door. He'll be back soon, and he don't like strangers. He won't be happy you came inside uninvited. Adam Stickler's missing sister. He won't be coming back today. Jenna led the girl to a chair at a scrubbed wooden table. What's his name? Jane's shoulders slumped, and she shook her head. I don't know, for sure. He made me call him Daddy, but he ain't my father. She swallowed hard. I don't even know if my family is still alive. Jenna smiled at her. Yes, as far as I'm aware, they're fine. And your brother Adam, he lives in Black Rock Falls. Deputy Kane spoke to him recently. Can you take me home to see my mom? I live in Blackwater. Jane blinked. He took me to town to see a doctor and said we could visit my mom, but he didn't get the time. Jenna opened her mouth to ask why she had not told the doctor Dorsey was holding her prisoner when Kane cleared his throat. She turned and walked with him to the other side of the room. What is it? I need to speak with her. She has Stockholm Syndrome. Kane's eyes flicked to the girl and back. She has been held captive for so long she figures she belongs here. That is normal. The brain shuts down and protects them from what is really happening. 
She isn't afraid of me. That was the clue. Seeing strange men is normal to her. She likely has feelings for Eli as well. Some kids cry for their captors when rescued, even after suffering abuse. You'll have to tread easy. She gave him a nod and returned to Jane. He sent us to have you see a doctor at the hospital, but I promised to speak to your mom and see if she'll meet us there. Do you know where he kept the key to your manacles? With the keys to his car. Jane pushed matted hair from her face. We have his keys. Jenna glanced at the lifeless eyes of the various elk heads hanging on the walls. The house appeared to be surprisingly clean, unlike the girl standing before her. She was pitifully thin. The skin on her bony arms had bruises, some clear indication of finger marks. Her feet and legs appeared scratched, and she had a festering sore on one ankle. Jenna had seen similar marks to the bruising on her neck on strangulation victims. Can I get you out of those chains? Kane's gaze slid over the girl, his face etched with concern. Jane leaned into Jenna and looked up at him. Jenna patted her hand. Kane is a very gentle man. All he wants to do is set you free. When Jane nodded, Kane moved closer, and Jenna could feel her trembling against her. Take it slow, Kane. Okay. Kane dropped his voice to almost a whisper and avoided eye contact with her. I spoke to Adam recently about you. He has never stopped looking for you. I'll call him straight away, and he can meet us at the hospital. Kane went through the keys, then he unfastened the cuff. There you go. As Kane pulled the cabin apart, collecting boxes of thumb drives and a computer, Jenna used her cell phone to access the driver's license image of Eli Dorsey. She held it up for the girl to see. Is this the man who chained you up? Jane nodded, then turned her face away. Is he in trouble? No. Can you tell me anything about him or his friends? The girl shook her head, sending dirty hair falling over her face. Jenna sat beside her. How did you come to be here? She lifted her troubled gaze. His friends will kill my family if I tell. In an effort to hide her distress, Jenna took a deep breath. No, we'll protect your family. His name is Eli Dorsey. She glanced at the girl. We are looking for his friends. She gripped the girl's hands. We need your help. Will you at least tell me how you met him? That was a long time ago. Jane stared into the distance. I don't remember. When he left, did he tell you where he was going? No. Jane gave her a wary stare. He had a new girlfriend, didn't he? That's why the others stopped coming here. Jenna sighed. I'm not sure. Do you remember anything else at all about the other men? Scars, tattoos? One had a spider tattoo on his hand between his thumb and index finger. I'm done here. Kane came back into the room, and Jenna noticed a flash of anger in his eyes. There are a few chickens out back running loose. They'll survive on their own. There's a stream running through the property. He held out an evidence bag filled with pills. I found a massive supply of contraceptive pills in the bathroom. I gather that's why he took her to the doctor's. You might need to mention them to the doctor at the hospital. Okay, let's go. Jenna looked at the girl. Is there anything you want to take from the house before you leave? I'm not coming back. Jane appeared agitated. Maybe we should leave him a note. Jenna shot a glance at Kane. Don't worry. We'll tell him. Chapter 16 After delivering Jane to the hospital and leaving Walters to watch over her, Kane waited for Jenna to speak briefly to Jane's brother and the doctor before returning to the office. The girl would remain in the hospital for a few days to complete tests and a mental health evaluation, then return to her family. 
Any further interviews with her would have to wait until the doctor had cleared her later that day. Kane glanced at Jenna on the way back to the office. What next? We are in a wait-and-see situation right now. Jenna's head bent over her notes. I've requested another interview with Zoe, and the doctor will speak to the parents shortly. She glanced at him. While we wait for the autopsy on Dorsey, it means some grunt work. We have no other men who might be implicated in the sex ring, so we'll have to shake the murder suspects and see what falls out. One of them must be withholding information on the men involved, or is the vigilante killer. Kane drummed his fingers on the steering wheel and considered her plan. I gather you want to find the two remaining men in the pedophile ring, but how will this lead us to the killer? They could have kidnapped a dozen girls over the last ten years. If we find just one of them, we could use them as bait. Jenna smiled. If the vigilante is coming for them, we'll catch her in the act. Okay, I guess we have no choice. Right now, the vigilante is all smoke and mirrors, but I suggest we keep a close eye on Harper, Bouval, and McCarthy as our three prime suspects. Where do you want to start looking for these men? He sighed. We can't set up a sting operation by pretending to be a young girl in one of a thousand possible chat rooms. We'll be stepping all over a possible FBI investigation, and it would take too long. Predators are cautious. They would have groomed the girls for months. They might kidnap a girl, but they are unlikely to risk meeting a girl they've just met online. They are aware of the traps. By the time we lure one, the vigilante will have killed the other two in the ring. Plus, we might end up with a man from another county. These men travel miles to meet up with kids. One of the FBI agents mentioned much the same to me on the phone the other day. We do have one lead to follow up, though. Zoe and Jane mentioned a spider tattoo. We'll start there. Jenna snapped her book shut. I'll make some calls and get permission to re-interview Zoe. I'll talk to the parents of both girls and see if they have alibis for the time of death of both victims so we can rule them out. She flicked him a glance. Take your lunch break now, and I'll go when you get back. Kane smiled at her. I'll call you if I find out anything interesting. He pulled up outside the sheriff's office. See that you do. Jenna slipped from the seat and strolled to the office without a backward glance. Kane headed down to Aunt Betty's cafe for lunch, but food was the last thing on his mind. In the space of three days, they had found two kidnapped girls and the same number of dead men. They had no suspects to arrest for the kidnapping crimes, as according to the girls, the dead men had acted alone, but they needed to find at least two other men involved in molesting girls. It will be like finding a needle in a haystack. He walked into the cafe, took his favorite seat by the window, then ordered his lunch from Susie Hartwig. Sipping his coffee, he mulled over the suspects and possible scenarios. The killer, or killers, knew the molesters' identities, which meant at one time the men involved had not been as careful as they were now. His mind wandered to his meeting with the Bouval brothers, Although as mad as rabid dogs about their sister's ordeal, her kidnapper, McGregor, had spent time in jail for the crime. They had no apparent motive to hunt down the other men unless they had reason to believe they had been involved in taking their sister. Had she told anyone? A child going through the ordeal of kidnapping would be in shock and might not remember details. Angelique could well have identified McGregor as her kidnapper, and years later recognized two of the clowns working with her brothers as the other men involved. Maybe she did not want to go through another trial, or believe that too much time had passed since her kidnapping to bring the other men to justice. If she had informed her brothers, it was feasible for them to take the law into their own hands to save their sister from reliving the events. Who else on his list of suspects had a motive? Could Lizzie Harper's father tie in with this case? From what her mother told him, at least one other man was involved, and the timeline fit. He would need to look deeper to find the answers. He understood how predators worked on kids' minds. The lies they told went way past telling the child their parents had died. 
The kidnapper often threatened to kill the kid's family if they escaped. And if the molester held the kid for months or years, that type of programming would be difficult to break. What would happen if one of these kids came face to face with their captor as an adult? Would they suffer a flashback, then plot revenge? He pulled out his cell phone and accessed the case files. He meticulously read everything on the kidnapping and murder cases. Nothing seemed to overlap. Although he needed to locate Stuart James McGregor, the man who had kidnapped Angelique Bouvel. As the court had sealed Angelique's file, he would like to speak to her as well, in case she had overheard the mention of other men. If he presented the facts to her as an adult, she might cooperate. Then again, she could have been the first girl the men had kidnapped and might have escaped before the other victims became involved. He turned his attention to the dwindling list of suspects and wondered if Rowley had discovered similar cases in any of the other towns. Adam Stickler's alibi had checked out, so he deleted him from his list of suspects, then considered the women living in town who had suffered abuse as kids. Lizzie Harper and her mother went to the top of his list. A mother and daughter seeking revenge was a distinct possibility, especially as they moved around the area frequently. He would need to speak to the school teacher, Patty McCarthy, and with Jenna busy, he would have to take the rookie, Paula Bradford, with him. If Miss McCarthy had a problem with men, having a female deputy along might be of assistance. He dropped some bills on the table, then strolled back to the office. Glad to see Rowley fully in control, he sat down in his cubicle and planned his afternoon. If Angelique Bouvel was living with her parents in Blackwater, he would speak to Jenna later, and maybe they would arrange to visit Angelique. His mind went to Jenna. With another murder, he worried about her PTSD flashbacks. If he could take her mind off the case for an hour or so, it would help, and he wondered if she would accept an invitation to dinner. Perhaps if he tied up as many loose ends as possible this afternoon, he could try to convince her to put work aside for an hour. Yeah, dinner would be a good idea for a start. She had to eat. I will take her to the Cattleman's Hotel. I'll need to book a table. He put that on his to-do list and, flipping open his notepad, found the number of the clean-as-a-wink cleaning service and called them. When he identified himself, the person on the end of the line informed him where to find the Harpers that afternoon. He jotted down the details, then went online to look up Patty McCarthy's address. As Rowley suspected, she lived on School Road, close to Stanton Forest. He took down the details, then pushed to his feet and scanned the office for Bradford. He strolled to her desk and cleared his throat. I'm going to interview a suspect. He stared into her big, startled eyes and wondered how she would cope in a crisis if he scared her by speaking to her. He offered her a comforting smile. I want you to ride shotgun. Yes, sir. Bradford gave him a curt nod, collected her things, and followed him to his SUV. May I ask what case? Kane slid behind the wheel, waiting for her to buckle up, then took off down the road. Lights flashing to disperse the crowd. People strolling around as if jaywalking was legal leapt back onto the sidewalk and glared at him. Once off the main street, he flicked her a glance. The murders. We have a theory that a vigilante is murdering a group of pedophiles. The killer could be taking revenge on the man who abused her as a child. Or it could be a family member of an abused child. What do we have on the pedophile ring? Not much. We believe there was a group of at least four men involved. And going on the fact they kept one of the girls for eight years, we must assume the group has been active for some time. Nothing came to light from an FBI investigation into child exploitation last year after we arrested a man for child pornography. I believe these men are very smart. We're not hanging around chat rooms or other online forums long enough for the FBI to notice them. I think, considering the time between the cases, they slipped through the net. How could that be possible with an ongoing FBI investigation? Lack of boots on the ground. Kane grimaced. Last count, there were 346 listed sex offenders in Montana alone, which are their main priority. They have a grading system as to how dangerous they are considered. 
There are probably thousands of predators they haven't detected yet. He sighed. I wondered how many kids went missing over the last ten years, so contacted the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and they told me approximately 800,000 children are reported missing each year. That's about 2,000 per week. He looked at her startled expression. Yeah, horrific, but true. That's terrible. What about Zoe? Bradford looked shocked. Didn't anyone look for her? Kane shook his head. Not here. She went missing from Helena. The Blackwater records listed Jane Stickler as a runaway. I did find one local case involving Angelique Bouville and investigated by the Blackwater sheriff. It led to the arrest of Stu McGregor. He is on the register as a low-risk pedophile. The other one involved Lizzie Harper, who killed her father for molesting her. Okay. What do I need to know about the suspects we are interviewing? They are women who suffered abuse in the last 15 years. The first is Patty McCarthy, a schoolteacher. Kane flicked her a glance. I found a note on her case. It seemed the sheriff of the time was convinced she was making up a story to get attention. He failed to follow up with a medical examination. It was a botched investigation from the start. I want to know if anything really happened. So you need me along as a woman, not as your deputy. Bradford gave him a disappointed look and dropped her gaze to her hands. As the women involved have issues with men, I want Miss McCarthy to feel comfortable during the interview. Slightly annoyed, he cleared his throat. As my deputy, it will be your responsibility to ask her the questions. It is unlikely she will speak to me about such a sensitive issue. What do you want me to ask her? First of all, ask her whereabouts between Monday through to last night. Then lead into questions about her complaint. When it occurred, how many men were involved. Does she remember any names at all? He glanced over to see her writing in her notebook. Tell her we found two kidnapped girls this week and we're investigating similar cases to see if they're linked. Ease into the questions. I want you to wear your earbud and mic so I can hear you. Then, if I think of anything else to ask her, I'll contact you. So you're not coming to the door with me? Bradford searched his face as she attached her earbud and switched on the receiver. He turned the car onto School Road, found the house, and pulled up outside. I'll be close by, but I don't want to frighten her. He pulled out his communication device and waved her from the car. When Deputy Bradford knocked on the door, Kane caught sight of an athletic woman in her mid-twenties. He listened with interest as Bradford explained the reason for her visit. As you can imagine, we are following any possible leads to prevent this from happening to other children. Bradford's voice dropped to a confidential whisper. Any information you could offer might save another girl from being taken. Really? Why come to me now? Patty McCarthy's voice was shrill. No one offered to help me at the time, did they? My parents thought I was lying, and so did the sheriff. I don't think you lied, or I wouldn't be here. Bradford straightened. Do you mind telling me about your whereabouts this week? I was home most of the time. I don't go out much. Patty sneered. Oh, this isn't about the girls you found, is it? I watched the news. You think I had something to do with the men's bodies showing up all over town? She snorted, as if in disgust. Well, let me see. I went out on Wednesday into town to buy groceries and walked around the festival. I did see a few people I know. Let me see. Susie Hartwig at Aunt Betty's Cafe. Will that do? I'll speak to her. Bradford made a few notes. Anyone else? Not that I recall, but I'm sure many people saw me in town. What about Saturday night? Bradford cleared her throat. Did you go out at all? I was home alone. I don't go out on dates. What make of car do you drive? Bradford looked down at her notebook. A jeep. Patty stared past her at Kane. Do you need the earbud communication device so Deputy Kane can listen? Does he get off on hearing the lurid details? She snorted and her lip curled. Yes, I know your name, Deputy Kane. 
I don't see you taking women out on dates. Prefer little girls, do you? Kane turned his head, disturbed by her disgusting insinuation. He spoke into his mic. I can't believe she teaches children with that kind of attitude. Keep asking the questions. Miss McCarthy, if you have a valid reason for that comment, I'm sure Sheriff Alton will be more than happy to take your complaint. But right now, we need information. Bradford tossed her blonde head in an agitated manner. You told the sheriff someone kidnapped you as a child. Can you remember how many people were involved? Okay, fine. But you need to watch men like Deputy Kane. I'll make sure I do. Bradford hunched her shoulders. Please, Miss McCarthy, any details you can offer would be of great help. I remember the kidnapping like it was yesterday. A man grabbed me from my bed, dragged me out the window, and bundled me into his car. Patty grunted in anger. Four men abused me, then one of them dropped me back inside my window. When I told my dad, he said I was having a bad dream. Her eyes blazed. They didn't even call a doctor to examine me. My father hit me and told me he was ashamed of me. She bit down hard on her lip, leaving marks. He took me to the sheriff's office as a punishment. He wanted him to lock me up for the night to scare me straight. No one would believe me. No one. I believe you. Where did the assault occur? In a house? No, not a house. Patty shook her head. It was the fall festival. Like now. I'm pretty sure he took me to a tent in the park. I could hear the canvas flapping. The hair on the back of Kane's neck stood on end. Ask her if they wore masks. Bradford relayed the question, and he waited for Patty to reply. They put a bag over my head and gagged me, but I remember things about them. The smell of them, for instance. But it is too late to do anything now. It would be my word against theirs, wouldn't it? Maybe not. Can you remember anything significant at all? Any small thing might help us to find these men. Enough questions. I am not going to rake this up again. It gives me nightmares. I've been in therapy for years. Patty shook her head and backed away. That's all I'm going to say. I have to go. I have an appointment in town. Just one more thing. How long ago did this happen? Fourteen years ago this week. Patty's gaze moved back to Kane in the car, and if looks could kill, he would be toast. He barked out a question. Ask her if one had a spider tattoo on his hand, and tell her two of them have been murdered. Watch for her reaction. When Bradford relayed the question, from Kane's viewpoint, he could see the color drain from Patty's face. She snarled her reply. I don't remember, but I'm glad they are dead. They got what they deserved. Chapter 17 Meddling Cops She strolled down the main street in an effort to cool her anger. The sheriff was obviously arrowing in on victims and not concentrating on catching the monsters. She hated crowds, hated men, but had to act normal to rid the world of pedophiles. She strolled past the community hall and forced her lips to smile at the old women selling their wares on the white linen-covered stalls, then wove her way through the hordes of kids trailing balloons. Kids she liked just fine, but men she could not trust. With the Black Rock Falls County Sheriff's Department crawling all over the mountains, the next monster would have to wait. She needed to take her time with him and would have to distract the sheriff away from the area. Killing a monster took time. As they liked to play games with the little girls they violated, she would return the favor. The previous day, in a chat room with him, he told her he wanted to play a special game with her, and she willingly agreed. She smiled into the sunshine. I guess a dying man deserves a final wish. 
Sipping her takeout coffee, she stared at the young girls moving through the crowds, enjoying the festival, oblivious to the threat close by. Little did they know, like an eagle spotting a rabbit, a destroyer of innocence could swoop down and steal them away in seconds. Predators believed they were invincible, untraceable, and safe. But she would find them, and she would kill them. She would kill them all. Chapter 18 Jenna's cell phone chimed. She stared at the unidentified caller ID and leaned back in her office chair. Sheriff Alton, this is Dr. Allen. You'll be pleased to know Zoe is well enough to speak to you this afternoon. Zoe's parents are more than happy for you to speak to their daughter, but I must insist you keep the question time to a limit. You should be aware shock can creep up on a person. She sighed with relief. Thank you. I can assure you I will be most careful. I'm coming alone. I'll let them know. How long before I can talk to Jane? It is early days, Sheriff. Her parents have just arrived. I'll be in touch when she is available. Sure. Thank you. I'm on my way now. After disconnecting, she called Kane and relayed the news. Did you get anything out of Patty McCarthy? Not much. She can't identify the man who took her. Okay, I have to go. We'll talk later. Have a chat with the Bouval brothers again and find out if their sister is willing to speak to us. I was heading that way. Good luck with the interview. Jenna smiled. Thanks. Twenty minutes later, she parked her car in the police and emergency services parking lot at the hospital and made her way inside. She rode the elevator up to the restricted ward. The hospital smell brought back a wave of bad memories from her near-death experience the previous winter, and she fought the need to turn around and leave. I have to stop acting like an idiot and help the kids. She found Zoe scrubbed clean and with her hair tied in a ponytail, sitting up in bed looking quite bewildered as her siblings dashed around the room playing with latex glove balloons. A woman stood when she entered, and as she approached, Jenna could see she had been crying. Mrs. Channing, I'm Sheriff Alton. I've come to have a few words with Zoe, if that's okay. Yes, yes, of course. I can't thank you enough for bringing Zoe home to us. Mrs. Channing waved hopelessly at the other children. My husband went to buy coffee. He'll be back soon, and we'll take the children outside. Mom? Zoe's small hands gripped the sheets. I want to speak to Sheriff Alton alone. I really should be here. Mrs. Channing patted Zoe's arm. You need your mother's support. I don't want to speak to you about what happened, and I don't want Dad listening either. Zoe's eyes filled with tears. Please, Mom, I need to do this on my own. Jenna smiled at the anxious woman. I'll be five minutes or so. I won't upset her. It's just routine questions. Okay, I'll be right outside the door. Mrs. Channing ushered the noisy kids into the hallway, shutting the door behind her. I need to know something. Zoe's frightened gaze raked her face. When you catch the man... My dad said I would have to be brave and tell the judge everything that happened. I'm not sure I can do that in front of everyone. A tear welled up in her eye and ran down one cheek. Jenna pulled up a chair and sat down. No, you won't be in front of everyone if it gets to court. She took a deep breath. It will be what we call a closed court, and if you need to testify, it will be just you in a room on your own with a camera. No one outside the court will even see your face or hear your name. She sighed. Didn't your dad tell you we closed the court to protect you? He did say something, but I don't want to talk to him right now. Why are you here? Jenna took out a notepad and her cell phone from her purse 
then turned on the voice recorder. You mentioned the men on the weekends. During the week, did you sleep in the cellar or with Amos? Amos. Zoe's cheeks pinked, and she stared at her hands. She needed to move away from the subject and smiled to reassure her. Who cleaned the cellar after the men left? They did, before they left. That's really helpful. Jenna made a few notes. Did Amos let you shower at all? Yes. He wouldn't let me to waste the hot water during the week, but at the weekends, he let me to shower and wash my hair with nice soap. She sniffed. He locked me in the cage all day. Jenna tried to keep her voice from showing her anger. If I show you pictures of three men, can you tell me if you recognize any of them? Okay. Zoe straightened as if stealing herself. Opening her phone, Jenna showed her a compilation of three men. Amos Price, Eli Dorsey, and a picture of a stranger taken at random from the files. Do you recognize the man that kidnapped you? Yes, that is Amos. I'm not sure, but that one, Zoe pointed to Eli, has a brown mark on his neck, the same as one of the others. Goosebumps rose on Jenna's flesh. Good girl. You have been very helpful. She noticed the girl brighten. You don't have to be scared of Amos or the man with the mark on his neck any longer. They are both dead. I hope Deputy Kane shot them dead with his gun. Zoe smiled. Deciding not to explain, Jenna turned off the recorder and stood. That's all for now, Zoe. You have been very helpful. She patted her arm and headed for the door. I'll send in your parents. Outside in the hallway, she approached the parents. We know the man responsible for kidnapping Zoe. Give me his name. I'll tear him apart. Mr. Channing's hands balled into fists. His name is Amos Price. Jenna cleared her throat. We found him deceased. It was when we checked his cabin we discovered Zoe. She gave me a positive ID. He was the man responsible. She swallowed the bile in her throat. Although Zoe refuses to discuss her abduction, you should be aware we know four men were involved. We found a second man murdered this morning, and she identified a distinctive birthmark on his neck. She looked at Mr. Channing. May I ask where you and your wife have been since we found Zoe? Here. Mr. Channing blanched. The hospital gave us the room next door. Apart from visiting the cafe for meals, we haven't left her side. She eyed him critically. You do realize I have a deputy on duty. Well, then he will prove we have not left the building. He checked us out before we were allowed to come near her. Mr. Channing shook his head. Haven't we been through enough without you accusing us of murder? Jenna lifted her chin and met his gaze head on. I am just doing my job, Mr. Channing. I doubt the hospital will keep Zoe for long. Do you have adequate security to protect her? I fully intend to take my family back to Helena the second she is released, which I'm told will be later today. Mr. Channing bristled. You don't think for one second I would leave her or any of my other children anywhere near Black Rock Falls, do you? Well, I have your cell phone number, and I will contact you personally and update you when necessary. Thank you for your cooperation. She turned and headed toward the elevator. She got out her cell phone and called Kane. Zoe gave me a positive ID for Price as her abductor. She confirmed Price cleaned her up for his friends on weekends, and they scrubbed the place down before they left. Did she ID Eli Dorsey? Not exactly, but she did recognize the birthmark on his neck. The chances of two men having the same mark would be remote. That's good enough for me. I hope we find their associates soon. I'd like to close this case. She sighed. I'm heading home. I'll work from there. You keep interviewing suspects. Roger that. She disconnected. I will catch you soon, you bastards.
Chapter 19 Kane swung the SUV around and headed back to town to speak to the Bouval brothers again, wondering how cooperative they would be about asking their sister to speak about her ordeal. With his mind locked on the case, he had not said more than a couple of words to the new deputy. Her references from the Helena Sheriff's Department had been outstanding, but he had yet to see if she would be an asset to the team. He glanced at Bradford, who had not stopped gawking at him since she got in the car. You did a great job questioning Miss McCarthy. She isn't the most pleasant person. I'm keeping her on the list of suspects. Nothing she said convinced me she is innocent. What vibe did you get from her? Not much. She was pretty aggressive, and the attack on you was unexpected. Many abused kids see men as a threat, and her response is quite common. Kane shrugged. Once the crime was reported, she would have told her story many times. It would have been hard on a young kid. I guess so. Bradford bent her head over her notes. It was great having you in my ear, prompting the questions. But you won't make a profiler if you fail to notice body language. He sighed. Making small talk was the last thing on his mind, but not wanting to appear rude or aloof, he smiled at her. What made you ask for a transfer to Black Rock Falls? I think the chances of promotion are better in a smaller office. Plus, working with a superior team is a good way to learn. Bradford returned his smile with a flash of straight white teeth. I'm not trying to brown-nose you, but I heard what happened last summer and wanted to be part of the team. Weber told me about your profiling skills, and working alongside a deputy who is also the M.E. can only improve my skills. She cleared her throat. I was hoping to be partnered with you to gain experience. He kept his gaze on the road. Moving into town, the traffic slowed to a crawl. Well, technically you're partnered with Deputy Rowley. You will ride with the sheriff or me as needed. Most times I'm on call-outs with the sheriff. He glanced over to see her face drop. We prefer to ease our rookies into the way of things here, but I'll take you to the practice range once a week, and I'm sure Rowley will introduce you to his dojo. The more hand-to-hand -hand combat you can practice, the better. We have to deal with some rough types. Okay, she brightened. I would appreciate some extra training. I heard you shot a man holding a knife to the sheriff's throat last winter. Wasn't that a risky thing to do? She gave him an accusing glare. You could have killed her. Not likely. Kane pulled the vehicle to the curb. I never miss. He found the Bouval brothers in the same area of the park giving pony rides to a line of kids. Parents stood patiently ignoring the Oda horse and swarming flies as they waited for their child's turn. Glancing at Bradford, he indicated with his chin toward the clowns, Wait here and log the interview in your notebook while it's fresh in your mind. I need a word with the Bouval brothers. He strolled in their direction and walked beside Claude Bouval. Smiling at the little girl perched on top of the pony, he lowered his voice. May I have a quick word? What is it now? Claude Bouval's red and white spotted shoulders slumped. Kane ignored his hostility and kept in step with him, moving carefully around the piles of horse dung lining the circular path around the park. Do you think Angelique will speak to the sheriff? We have a few leads, and she might remember something significant. I doubt it. She doesn't like to speak about it at all, but I know something of interest. Our family has been clowns for generations, so she has no need to fear clowns. But since it happened, she will not have a clown costume in the house. This is why my brother and I left Blackwater and moved to Black Rock Falls to prevent her distress. She is here today, visiting a friend, but she won't come near us in costume. We will meet her later without the paint. Kane pushed a little harder, but aware of the child on the pony, he kept his words ambiguous. Her information might save the same thing happening again. Okay, I will ask her, and if she agrees, I will call you. He let out a long sigh. I have your card. 
Kane smiled. Thanks. Monday would be good if that suits. He patted the pony, then strolled back to Bradford. Next stop, I'm dropping into the real estate office. I want to speak to Mr. Davis or Allison Saunders, his assistant. We can walk from here. It will be quicker. People on the street stepped aside to give him access to the real estate office. He took in the clean windows and new listings posted in neat containers and smiled. Old Mr. Davis did not have the attention to detail Allison offered. He pushed open the door, surprised to find the usual heavy odor of cigar smoke replaced with a citrus bouquet. One thing remained the same. Mr. Davis sat behind the main desk, staring at his computer, but he could see Allison Saunders speaking to a client in the back room. Ah, Deputy Kane. Anyone been murdered today? Davis's mouth twitched into a grimace. It's not good for business, you know. Kane straightened. I'm sure it's not good for the victims, either. He cleared his throat. Just one question. Are all your master keys accounted for? And where in town do you normally have them cut? Every key is signed in and out. Davis took a book out of his drawer and opened it on the desk. Here. He prodded the page with the tip of a pudgy finger. The keys are cut at the hardware store, but we haven't lost one in over five years. How does it work? I mean, different houses can't have the same type of lock, can they? Bradford's brow creased. All the locks are changed for any houses we sell or agree to lease. Davis smiled at her, displaying yellowed teeth. Then we have a master key for all the properties. When a new owner takes residence, they receive their own unique set of keys. Once they use their key, the master key no longer works. Amazing but true. Kane pulled out a cell phone. Do you mind if I take some pictures of the book? I'd like to know the people who had keys over the last couple of months. Be my guest. Kane used his cell phone camera to record the pages, then straightened and smiled. How is Allison working out? She is an asset to the business. Davis gave him a knowing smile. Pretty, isn't she? I think Deputy Rowley likes her, too. He drops by all the time to speak to her. He's like a lost puppy. Kane raised a brow. Really? I'll have to speak to him about wasting time. I see you have a new assistant as well. Davis flicked a glance over Bradford. Annoyed at the man's chauvinist regard for women, he narrowed his gaze. Yes, this is Deputy Bradford. She has joined the team. He glanced at her and, seeing her discomfort, decided to remove her from the situation. If you would prefer to wait outside for me, I won't be long. Yes, sir. Bradford gave him a relieved look as she pulled open the door and strolled into the sunshine. He cleared his throat. Does Allison manage all of Rockford's houses? Yes, and more. She is a good worker and sold two properties last week. Kane placed one hand on the door handle. She does seem efficient. That's all I need. Thank you for your time. He swung open the door and walked to Bradford's side. What a disrespectful jerk. You okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Thanks for getting me out of there. I hate men like him. Kane took in her pale face and pinched expression. Maybe we need to take a break. Coffee would be bliss. She smiled at him. I'm not hungry. The hardware store was opposite. Okay, I'm going to the hardware store. He pulled out his wallet and handed her some bills. We'll need to find the Harpers, and it may take some time. Do you want to slip over to Aunt Betty's cafe and grab us a coffee? Flat white with four sugars for me. If you wait outside, I'll go grab the car and pick you up. Sure. He watched her disappear into the crowd and called Jenna. Hey, it's me. What's up? Jenna yawned. No more bodies, I hope. No more bodies, Kane smiled. I thought you might like to have dinner out tonight. I have a reservation for a table tonight at eight at the Cattleman's Hotel. 
When she said nothing, he drew a deep breath. We both have to eat, and I need to discuss the case with you. Okay, why not? Great. I'll pick you up at 7.30. Sure. I'm heading over to see Wolf and attend the Dorsey autopsy. Then I'm going home. I'll bring you up to speed with the post. Rowley is locking up. Catch you later. The line went dead. Kane caught a break in the traffic and darted across the road. The bell on the top of the hardware store door chimed as he entered. He glanced around at the old world style interior with a variety of goods for sale. The place could not have changed since Prohibition. The slight odor of paint and chemicals brought back memories of shopping with his father. As he strolled to the counter, an elderly man tottered out from the back. He wore round spectacles and his long black eyebrows curled up, giving him the appearance of an owl. Afternoon. What can I do for you, Deputy Kane? I wondered if you keep a record of the keys you cut for people. Nope, can't say that I do. The old man rubbed his long nose. Too many to keep a record. Three, maybe four this week. He lifted cloudy blue eyes to his face. My son is a locksmith. He does the work now and is cutting keys all the time from his van. Kane blew out a sigh and tapped the counter with his fingers. Do you sell pesticides containing nicotine sulfate? The old man waved at a shelf crammed with bottles. There are quite a few brands. What do you need it for? Oh, it's not for me. Kane let his gaze drift over the bottles. Are you required to keep a list of purchasers? Nope. The storekeeper gave him a concerned look. I do for rat poison and a few other dangerous chemicals. I have a book, and they have to produce a current ID. But that stuff is used in gardens most times, and the bottles carry warnings. He sighed. We sell a fair few bottles. Not sure when I sold the last one. Maybe a few days ago, or maybe last week. I'm not sure. So it's readily available. Kane touched his hat and turned to the door. Okay, thanks for your help. He moved down the street and paused to purchase some cakes from one of the stalls. As he waited for his change, he caught sight of the magician making animals out of balloons, surrounded by kids. The crowd parted, and a woman emerged. He recognized the pale face of Patty McCarthy strolling by. He checked the time and made a note in his book. Hmm. She sure isn't acting like someone scared of crowds. Chapter 20 Jenna stuffed some cookies into her mouth, jumped in her car, and headed to the new Emmy's office. She entered the building using her swipe card and headed down the cool white passageways until she came to the pathology laboratory, knocking on the door as she entered. Wolf sat at a computer, and his assistant, a young pathology graduate named Steve, was preparing tissue samples. Am I too late for the post? Just a little, but I haven't finished yet, so I can go over my findings with you. Wolf's gaze slid over her, then he brushed a few crumbs from the sleeve of her shirt. Just eaten? I'm glad you have a strong stomach. Jenna shrugged. I'll be fine. Okay. Wolf stood and led the way into the morgue. I have a cause of death, and I found a few other interesting clues. The room resembled an operating theater, apart from the rows of drawers to store corpses set into two of the walls. The air was chilly, and the smell of dead bodies and cleaning chemicals hung in the air. On a long aluminum bench lay what remained of Eli Dorsey after the autopsy. She moved closer to Wolf. What do you have? As I thought, the cause of death was a puncture wound through the left ear and into the brain. He pointed to a specimen. If you look at the cross-section of the brain, I would say death was instantaneous. Jenna peered at the slice of human tissue in the Petri dish and nodded. I see. Was it painful? 
I don't recall anyone complaining of hearing screaming. Yeah, it would have been extremely painful. Wolf pointed one gloved finger to Eli's mouth. See the marks on his cheek? The tips of fingers caused the bruising. He had a pair of socks stuffed into his mouth, and the killer pressed down with a great deal of force with the left hand, then thrust the knitting needle or perhaps a meat skewer into his ear. I'm leaning toward the latter. I would say from the position of the marks, the killer was straddling him at the time. The killer was dressed as well. I found a few obscure filaments of denim stuck to the condom he was wearing at the time of death. She stared at the body, and her mind went into overdrive. Her time spent in the vice squad in her other life had taught her many things, and one of them was that many people enjoyed unusual sexual fetishes. Whatever a person craved, there was someone out there willing to accept payment to satisfy the most perverted needs— I thought this case was connected to a pedophile ring, but now I'm not so sure. This man looks as if he had a date for some rough sex, maybe with a dominatrix. From what I saw in the motel, the killer blindfolded him at some time and tied him up. If he paid for rough sex, he would not be alarmed when she covered his mouth. Do you have reason to believe this killer is female? Wolf looked at her over his face mask. I admit the fingertips are small, but a number of men have small fingertips as well. He sighed. Then there is the handprint on the cheek. I believe the killer slapped him, and as his body goes into rigor, the print has become more evident. Can you see it is a small hand? It could be female. Jenna walked around the body. I think so. Going on the chocolates and wine, I'm leaning toward a hooker or a kinky sex date. It points to that, but I'm not convinced. Wolf met her gaze. I think your instincts were right the first time. I think the killer is the same person who murdered Price. Both crime scenes stink of a predator. The gifts, for instance. The majority of predators arrested for luring kids to places with the intention of having sex have a bag of gifts with them. Jenna chewed on her bottom lip, staring at the body. If the men knew each other, her assumption of a vigilante killer was becoming a reality. She glanced up at Wolf. Did you remove the blindfold on scene? No. It was on his forehead when I arrived. Then I'm going with the vigilante theory. And the removal of the blindfold is crucial evidence. I figure she wanted to see his eyes as she killed him. She stared at Wolf. Now all we have to do is figure out who she is. Chapter 21 Kane moved through the crowd on the way to the park and headed for the magician working the street. The man was not wearing gloves and did not have a spider tattoo, but he needed to ID him. He waited for an opportune moment and tapped him on the shoulder. The man turned slowly, and small black eyes moved over his face. Is there a problem? I'd like your name. Kane pulled out his notebook and pen. Are you with party time? A relieved look passed over those black eyes, and the magician nodded. I am, and I'm licensed. My name is Stu McGregor. Kane stared at him in disbelief. He knew McGregor was classed as a low-risk sex offender in Montana, but was surprised the local council had issued him a license to be anywhere near kids. Really? Show it to me. I'm rehabilitated. Certified. I haven't offended for seven years. I agreed to chemical castration so I could continue working in a restricted capacity. In any case, how could I do anything wrong with all these people around? McGregor glared at him, then unzipped his costume, dug into a pocket, and thrust it at him. Kane examined the documents. McGregor's license restricted him to public street performances. Attached to it was a notice giving his classification as a low-grade sex offender. He shook his head in disbelief. It seemed every state and town council had a different way of dealing with pedophiles— Okay, he thrust the paperwork back at him. 
I did my time, and you were hassling me for no good reason. I'll do more than that if any kids go missing from my town. Kane eyeballed him. I'm watching you. He turned and strolled toward his vehicle. As he made his way to pick up Radford, he wondered if there was a connection between Stuart James McGregor and Patty McCarthy. The age seemed to be right, but getting information out of Miss McCarthy would be like getting blood out of stone. He double-parked outside Aunt Betty's cafe, much to the annoyance of the cars behind him. And Bradford jumped into the passenger seat, coffees in hand. He took the cardboard carry container from her and deposited the cups in his console. Thanks. I asked Susie Hartwig if she remembers seeing Miss McCarthy in town, but she can't be sure with the hundreds of people she has served during the festival. She does remember seeing her on Saturday evening around six. She stopped by for a meal. Kane scratched his cheek. So Patty McCarthy was lying about staying home. Looks like it. Now what? Bradford glanced at him. Next on my list is Lizzie Harper. I know about her. She stabbed her father to death and served jail time. Bradford's gaze moved over Kane's face. Why would you suspect her? She was in a juvenile detention center for three years and had her son there. Kane reached for his coffee and took a sip, keeping his eyes on the road ahead. I have a gut feeling there were more men involved in her case than she told the court. She claimed to have stabbed her father because he was constantly abusing her. Problem is, the boy she claimed was fathered by him belongs to someone else. As she was 14 at the time, and her mother helps her raise the kid, I wonder if Lizzie finally told her about the other men. They could be taking out the pedophiles one at a time. And if they're not the killers, then you figure they might know the names of the men involved in the pedophile ring. Kane nodded. Exactly. He turned the SUV around and headed toward a cluster of small land holdings on the outskirts of town. They are working on two houses this afternoon. Let's see what we can find out. He drove to the first address on the list, but as their work vehicle was not out front, he started to back out of the driveway, stopping when the front door opened. Someone is at home after all. Bradford's mouth curled into a smile. It looks like the mother. Maybe she'll be easier to talk to. Kane slid from the seat. The woman standing at the door, wearing a thin cotton dress, apron, and a pair of kitchen gloves, eyed him with suspicion. He strolled toward her with Bradford close behind. I'm Deputy Kane, and this is Deputy Bradford. We're looking for Mrs. Harper and her daughter Lizzie. I'm Rosemary Harper. Lizzie had an appointment in town, but she should be back soon. What do you want? I've already told you more than I should have. I appreciate your help, ma'am, but I have a few more questions. Kane pulled out his notebook and pen. I believe you and your daughter cleaned the property at 3 Maple Lane? Yes, but that was a week ago last Friday afternoon. So I've been told. He observed how nervous she appeared and stepped back. So where were you this week? We've been cleaning all of Rockford's houses for the real estate office, so we've been all over the last couple of weeks. She gave a nervous shrug. They would have a list. Okay. What about Friday night? Did you or Lizzie go out for any reason? Lizzie is always in and out. She hates being cooped up in the house. Mrs. Harper sighed. She went into town for a couple of hours. She wanted to have a look at the stalls and pick up some takeout. I remember she was gone for quite some time. She said she had a long wait at Aunt Betty's due to the festival. Why? Kane made a few notes in his book. We found a kidnapped child in a cabin in the mountains. The man involved is Amos Price. Have you heard the name? Could he have been involved in the incident involving Lizzie and her father some years back? Did Lizzie ever mention anyone else? No, there wasn't anyone else involved the day Pete died. Lizzie waited for him to come home that night and killed him. She glared at him. Don't look at me like that. She never said a word. Yes, I should have known, should have seen something. But it happened on their weekends away. 
My husband used to take her fishing with him. She bit her bottom lip. Lizzie hated fishing, but he insisted she do outdoor activities and would spank her if she refused to go with him. Has she ever said why she didn't tell you something was wrong? Bradford flicked Kane a glance, as if asking his permission. Not in so many words, but the truth came out in the trial. Mrs. Harper's eyes hardened. A bit too late for me to do anything to help her after she stabbed him to death. She wet her lips. My husband threatened her. If she mentioned one word of their secret, he would kill me. Sick to his stomach, Kane pushed on. Are the names Eli Dorsey or Stuart McGregor familiar to you? Could they have been friends of your husband? Why? Kane observed her face and the way her eyes blinked. Just answer the question. I know all about Stu McGregor. My husband loved magic tricks, and he made friends with a magician by the name of Stu. It was some time after he died I discovered Stu is the man who went to jail for kidnapping the Booville girl over in Blackwater. Mrs. Harper placed one hand over her mouth. Oh, my God. Was he involved with my Lizzie as well? There had to be another man, but Lizzie refuses to speak about it. She glanced up as the sound of a car engine came down the road. There she is now, but don't expect her to open up to you. She will only get angry. Kane rubbed his chin. Angry, huh? The van pulled up beside Kane's SUV, and a young woman stared at him open-mouthed. She slid out of the door, collected a number of takeout boxes, and walked toward her mother. Kane moved closer to Bradford and dropped his voice to just above a whisper. If she is hostile toward men, you might have to question her instead. Okay. Is something wrong? What are you doing here, Deputy Kane? Lizzie Harper's eyes flashed with anger. Mom, what's going on? Nothing to worry about. I'm sure Deputy Kane will explain. Mrs. Harper's agitated demeanor spoke volumes. Well, Lizzie stood, hands balled on her hips, and glared at him. Kane kept his distance, but met her gaze head on. May I speak to you in private, or would you prefer to speak to Deputy Bradford? Okay, I know you will use any excuse to make me break my parole. I'm not stupid. I'll talk to you over by your car. Lizzie thrust the takeout into her mother's hands, then strode away, back straight and head high. He followed and waited for her to turn around. Miss Harper, this is not about your parole. We're trying to discover the names of a group of men who kidnapped and abused a 12-year-old girl. How the hell should I know anything about a group of pedophiles? In case you missed the news, I killed my father. Kane cleared his throat. I don't think you were telling me the whole story, Miss Harper. I believe our latest victim's situation was much like yours. We know your father took you to his fishing cabin to abuse you. That's not a secret. Lizzie glanced toward her mother and grimaced. I'm sure she knew, but she is weak, and every time I tried to tell her, she'd shut me down. She glared at him. Don't come over all social worker on me and ask me why I didn't tell a teacher or someone— I was ashamed, that's why. He made me feel like shit, like I was nothing, dirty. No one would listen to me, so I had to deal with him myself. Kane leaned against the car, taking a casual pose in an effort to put her at ease. Was it just him, or did he have a few friends visit while you were there? Why? Her eyes flashed dangerously, and if she had been a rattlesnake, he would be dead. The girl we found told us she was held in the mountains and men would visit at the weekends. He noticed the color drain from her face and her agitation. We need to stop these animals before they grab another kid off the street. She shrugged and looked away. Miss Harper, I know this is hard for you, but did your father place you in the same situation? He took out his notepad and flipped through the pages. We found Amos Price murdered. 
Then Eli Dorsey. Both had kidnapped girls at their homes. I know these men are involved in a pedophile ring. Do these names mean anything to you? No. Oh, shit. I know what this is about. I take it my mother told you my son isn't my father's child. So now you want all the dirty little details. You men are all the same. Lizzie pushed both hands through her silky hair and lifted her chin. I don't have to tell you anything. Yeah, I killed my pervert of a father and did my time. Now, unless you want to charge me, I have work to do. Fine. Kane rubbed his chin. But the longer we have to look for the rest of these men, the more chance there is of them snatching another child. He inclined his head. As a matter of interest, as your son had a DNA test, I can obtain a court order to check it against our victims. If we get a match, you do realize I could arrest you on suspicion of murder. Really? Lizzie lifted her dimpled chin and smiled at him in an unhinged way. It sounds like he deserved to die. The problem with you, Deputy Kane is you are no different from any other man who has questioned me. You want me to tell you all the disgusting things they did to me so you can fantasize about it later. She held up a hand to prevent his reply. Arrest me or leave me the hell alone. She turned and stomped back toward her mother. The disgusting things they did to her. Her Freudian slip gave him all the information he needed. Chapter 22 That evening, Jenna stared at Dave Kane over the table at the Cattleman's Hotel restaurant. Filled to capacity, she had to squeeze past people to get to her seat. She could not help but notice the admiring glances Kane received from just about every woman who walked by— and the way he ignored them. She had to admit, he did look suave in a dark blue suit with his hair neatly combed, rather than plastered to his head from his cowboy hat. He smelled good, too. Do I have food in my teeth? He raised one black eyebrow, then smiled. Or does that look mean something else? They had become close friends in the last year and it was good to relax off-duty with him and not be the sheriff for a short while. She chuckled at his bemused expression. Maybe, she sighed. I like this, what we have. I've never had a close friend quite like you before. I'm glad we can be normal after hours as well. Kane winced. I have to admit, at first, not running things was difficult, but I adapt pretty well. She chuckled. You certainly do. I haven't had to take you out of back of the barn and teach you a lesson once. Uh-huh. Kane flashed a white smile at her. Even my dad wasn't game enough to try that means of punishment with me. He cleared his throat. I was fully grown at fourteen. She dropped her voice. Do you miss them? Your parents and family since you moved way out here? Kane's face took on a thoughtful look. More than you can imagine, but I guess I'm preaching to the converted. At once, she regretted intruding on his privacy and nodded. I miss friends, but I lost my parents before I signed up for my last gig. She sighed. There's no going back, is there? I would without a second thought if I could do something useful. He narrowed his gaze at her. I'm sure you understand my reasoning. She understood his carefully disguised conversation only too well, and cleared the lump in her throat. It didn't take a genius to know Cain would vanish from existence if offered the chance to take down the people who murdered his wife. Yeah, I do. And if you plan on going to a reunion, I'm going with you. As my date? Cain gave her a long, considering stare. Maybe. Picking up her glass of wine, she sipped, allowing the rich-bodied flavor to spill over her tongue. 
She needed to change the conversation before the evening was a total failure. I know you were dying to talk about the case. Since you arrived on my doorstep this evening, you've had a smug smile on your face. Really? Hmm, I must be losing my edge. He sipped his pop, and his blue gaze slid over her face. Bradford rode shotgun with me today to question a few suspects. She did very well for a rookie. That's good, Jenna smiled. So let's cut to the chase. What did you discover? Not much, Kane shrugged. Truth is, I wanted to discuss the interview with Lizzie Harper with you. Then discuss it before you blow a gasket. First of all, her mother mentioned she was out for some time on Friday evening, apparently getting takeout. We'll need to check with Davis at the real estate office and find out where the pair of them were working this week. Okay, so what did Lizzie Harper say? She didn't say much at all, mainly put all men down as pigs, but she did let it slip that more men were involved. Kane's lips curled into a satisfied smile. I didn't push for more information, but now she has given us a motive to obtain a court order for her son's DNA results. We'll be able to discover if one of our victims is his biological father. Jenna leaned forward. Really? Yeah. And her mother identified Stuart McGregor as a friend of her husband as well. So likely he was involved. Great. I'll get the paperwork underway for the court orders. I hope that's all, because my brain needs a rest. She sighed. Dinner with you tonight is a luxury. I hardly get time to eat lately. It's good to take an hour to think. We're not machines. Kane huffed out a sigh. These cases are horrific, and you've covered every angle for now. The suspects in the girls' abductions are dead, and we have little to go on to find their killers. If the DNA profile from one of the victims matches Lizzie's son, we'll have a motive. Okay, I'll delegate. Rally's on duty with Weber on Monday. They'll keep searching for associates of our murder victims. And providing we get the court order, I'll ask Wolf to run a check of the boys' DNA against our DNA database as well. There was a rape case before I arrived here, and many of the men volunteered their DNA. We might fluke a match. Let's hope so. Kane grimaced. I'm convinced the group of predators is bigger than we thought. We need to catch these assholes. Disturbed by the implications, Jenna placed her glass on the table. I've seen terrible things in my life, but this beats all. She lifted her chin. It plays on my mind 24-7. I can't sleep, so it makes it difficult to follow the shrink's recommendation and turn off for a while to prevent the flashbacks kicking in again. This information is so disturbing. Have any feel-good movies at your place to lull me to sleep? Yeah, I'll find something to cheer you up. He waved at the waiter for the check. If you want to get away for an hour, I'm going to see a couple of horses in the morning. I said I'd try and drop by around ten, unless we get dragged out to another damn murder. The one thing she liked about David Kane was his gentle side. When they were alone, his tough persona relaxed, and she could laugh with him. It was nice to put the job aside for a few minutes and be herself. She smiled. We should be on the case, but unless Wolf and Rowley come up with anything new, I guess we could grab an hour. I do need time to clear my head. It's hard when kids are involved. Trust me, Wolf will be working on those laptops all night, and you deserve a timeout. He handed the waiter his credit card and signed the bill, then looked at her. We'll have fun tomorrow, but I guess we'll have sore muscles on Monday. I haven't ridden for years, she laughed. Me neither. Maybe you should add a hot tub to your list of essentials. That's a thought. He took the credit card from the waiter and pushed to his feet. I'll look into it. Jenna gaped at him. Just how rich are you? They walked out into the balmy night and made their way to the parking lot. A light breeze carried the scent of roses from the tubs set each side of the entrance to the hotel. 
When his warm fingers cupped her elbow, the small touch surprised her, as he had not touched her intimately since the night he cuddled her a few months ago. She doubted anyone would see them as they walked between the rows of parked cars, and she leaned into him, enjoying the hard, muscular arm pressing against her bare flesh. The comfortable friendship they had established suited her well. He complimented her in so many ways, respected her at work, and understood her demons. As they reached the car, Kane's cell phone rang. He gave her an exasperated look and reached inside his pocket. David Kane. His expression changed to alarm, and he held up one finger, then put his phone on speaker. Who is this? A distorted voice came through the speakers, sending Jenna's teeth on edge. Why do you prefer pedophiles? Don't bother making up excuses. I know getting all the dirty little details from their victims turns you on. I can assure you. Cain flicked Jenna a worried glance. Sure you can. Men like you love kids, don't they? Love them to death most times. I am ridding the world of the scum, and you are protecting them. Stop getting in my way or you'll be next. The line went dead. Oh, my God. Jenna stared at his cell phone in disbelief. How the hell did the killer get your number? I give out my cards all the time, and Maggie has a pile at the front desk along with yours. He ran his fingers through his thick hair and grimaced. All the suspects I interviewed today have cards as well. As the caller electronically disguised their voice, I don't know if it was a man or woman. Damn it. I haven't activated the record call app on this phone, and now we have zip. Unsettled by the call, Jenna squeezed his arm. Even if you had a copy, it would have been useless. Not really. Wolf has the equipment to decode the voice print. Kane moved his blue gaze around the area. We'd better get out of the open just in case there's a shooter watching us. Jenna climbed into the car. I doubt the caller will stop at one call. I think we should all download the app in case something like this happens again. Roger that. Kane glanced around. We need to get out of here. Jenna fastened her seatbelt. What do you make of it? The call? The threats? Who would do that? They know I'm interviewing the victims. A nerve in his cheek twitched. So they are either following me or they are acquainted with one or more of them. He started the car and headed out of the parking lot. One thing that comes to mind is the caller almost paraphrased what Patty McCarthy, the schoolteacher, said to me today. She became angry when Bradford interviewed her and accused me of not dating women because she believes I prefer young girls. He cleared his throat. She is very astute and knew I was communicating with Bradford through the earbud and listening to their conversation. Jenna chewed on her bottom lip, trying to evaluate everything he had said. She turned in her seat to look at him. We have not considered the victims might know each other. There is every chance they could be in the same support group, for instance. I don't know of any here, but I haven't been involved with any cases of child abuse in Black Rock Falls. It's something we need to look into. Yeah, but so far most of the ones we've discovered occurred in Blackwater. He spun the wheel as they turned into Jenna's driveway. I completed most of my interviews today, and come to think of it, I only spoke to two victims of abuse, Patty McCarthy and Lizzie Harper. He pulled into his garage and turned to her. I asked the Bouville brothers if they could arrange for us to speak to their sister, Angelique. They mentioned she was in town today. He blinked, then scratched his cheek. Patty McCarthy said she had an appointment in town, and Lizzie Harper was on the way back from town when we arrived at the house they were cleaning today. The hairs on the back of Jenna's neck rose. That puts the three suspects in the same place at the same time. They could have easily met somewhere. It's too much of a coincidence to ignore. She stared at him. They could be working together to confuse us. If they are, we'll have one hell of a time catching the killer. Kane's dark eyebrows rose. There is strength in numbers. 
I can't imagine three women capable of murdering together. Men, maybe, but not many women have a pack mentality. Oh, yes, they do. Kane's gaze hardened. It depends on how well their leader influences them. Don't forget Manson's girls. He had a good point, and Jenna nodded in agreement. True. How did Lizzie Harper act toward you during questioning? Hostile. He met her gaze, and his narrowed. In fact, I would say pre-warned would come close. He pulled out his notepad and put on the interior light. She thought I was asking her questions because it turned me on. So she ties in as well. Mortified, she gaped at him. What did she say? Something along the lines of, I wanted her to tell me all the dirty little details, and men like me are all the same. Similar phrasing to Patty McCarthy's. He gave her a dejected look, pocketed his notebook, then turned off the light. Coming inside, or do you just want me to find you a movie to take home? I sure could do with some company, and I want to check out the local support groups. I'll stay for a while. She squeezed his arm. It's not you, Dave. After what those women have been through, trusting men would be difficult. And I guess your questions opened up old wounds. I know. But if we don't ask the difficult questions, we'll never catch the animals who did this to them. He sighed and scrubbed both hands over his face. They don't seem to understand we want to bring the men responsible to justice, not protect them. He shook his head slowly. I can't imagine why they think I would find hurting little girls stimulating. I've seen some terrible crimes, but child abuse makes me sick to my stomach. Jenna looked into his eyes and sighed. Me too. But there is nothing more we can do tonight. Check out the support groups. I'll dash home and change, then let's watch a movie. I'd like that. Thanks. Kane flashed her a grin and headed for the front door. Jenna dashed to her house and changed. As she walked into Kane's cottage, the old manager's residence on her ranch, she found him staring at his cell phone. Any luck? I'm still looking. Kane lifted his gaze and smiled at her. Could you make the coffee? Jenna strolled into the kitchen and filled the coffee maker. I haven't heard of any support groups. We have the breastfeeding mothers group in town, and a few others, but nothing like abused kids. I can't find anything at all. Kane wandered into the room with his dark head bent over the screen. I'll call a social worker on Monday and see if they can help. It's possible they're not listed for privacy reasons. If there's a link between Lizzie Harper and Patty McCarthy, it would make sense they met in a support group. Jenna leaned against the counter as the coffee pot sent out the tempting aroma of freshly ground beans. I bet they know our murder victims and were abused by them. One of those women could be our killer. Kane lifted his head from his cell phone and his dark gaze met hers. Or both. Chapter 23 Halfway through the movie, the silent alarm set into the wall flashed violently. An intruder had breached the perimeter of the property. Automatically reaching for his Glock, Kane jerked upright and switched off the TV. He turned to Jenna. Someone is outside. I'll go and check. I'm coming with you. Jenna's whisper came close by. We'll stick out in our light-colored shirts. Can you grab a couple of your black T-shirts? Roger that. Kane felt around the floor for her shoes and passed them to her, then slipped his feet into his boots. Duke scrambled to his feet and tipped his head from one side to the other as if listening. Kane patted the dog on the head. Stay. As Jenna moved silently through the house, extinguishing the lights, Kane padded into the bedroom, dragged a couple of black t-shirts from the dresser, and, finding her waiting in the doorway, he tossed one to her. Put this on. I'll check the cameras. He moved stealthily down the hallway, then slipped into his office, and after closing the blinds, flicked on the flat-screen array. 
Moments later, Jenna sneaked to his side. He leaned on the table and peered into the screens. Why didn't your house alarm trigger the floodlights? He glanced at her. The sensors I installed mean someone is moving close to the cottage. Too damn close. I have no idea. She glanced at him and pushed a hand through her tussled hair. I set the alarm before I left home. Intrigued, Kane stared at each monitor for any movement outside. Where are they? I can't see anything at all. Maybe it's a rabbit or something. He shook his head. Nah, the sensors are set for chest height, and we'd see a bear if it walked in. They don't exactly sneak around. Do you really believe anyone who knows us would be stupid enough to walk in here? Jenna glanced up at him with a scowl. I mean, really. He straightened. After the range of psychopaths we've had drifting into town of late, anything is possible. I'm going to take a look out the windows. I'll be right behind you. Adrenaline pumping, he killed the flat screens to block any light and slipped out into the hall, then moved from window to window, turkey peeking outside to check the immediate area. The moonless night was as dark as a cave. I can't see a damn thing. And my night vision goggles are in my SUV. Maybe we should wait and see how this plays out. No way. Jenna lifted her chin. If someone's breaking into my house, I'm going to arrest them. Concerned for her safety, Kane turned and looked at her shadowed face. We don't know the threat. And after the phone call earlier, we could be walking into a trap. Or they could be walking into ours. She tipped back her head and glared at him. It could be a simple break and enter, or a pervert. Who the hell knows? But damn it, Dave, together we're a bigger threat. A car horn wailed outside, and Kane heard Jenna's sharp intake of breath. He touched her arm, and her muscles bunched under his palm. He turned to glance at her. Okay, what do you want to do? Whoever is out there has to be pretty stupid to set off my car alarm. Unless they want to know our position. With my car parked outside, they wouldn't know I'm here with you. Jenna grabbed her keys from the table, then moved to the window and pointed the fob through the glass at her vehicle, stopping the noise in a blink of lights. Now they are aware we know they're here. I say we meet them head on. They haven't got our skills, and I sure as hell want to know who is sneaking around my house at night. He couldn't argue with her logic. Roger that. In his periphery, he caught sight of a dark outline against the white wall of Jenna's ranch house. The figure hesitated, then moved in their direction. Unknown bogey is by your living room window and heading this way. If we leave by the back door, we could take the advantage and come round behind them. Take the lead. I'll watch your back. Jenna's hand rested firmly on his belt. He strode swiftly to the back door with Jenna right on his heels, Glock raised. He punched in the code to deactivate the alarm, eased open the door, then turned to her and lowered his voice to a whisper. Count to three, then follow me. Keep your back to the wall. A cold certainty crept over him, and battle ready, he eased out of the door, gun in hand. Behind him, Jenna moved without making a sound, and they crept down the steps. Silently, they dashed along the side of the cottage, then crouched at the corner. He sniffed the air, but no stink of bear hung on the breeze. After bobbing his head around the corner and seeing no trace of the intruder, he waved her forward. After making a visual search of the immediate area, he led them to the front of the house. The back wall of the garage obscured the view of his front door, and he duck-walked along the perimeter, listening. A sound like a splash came from nearby, too darn close, and followed by a clatter as something hit the ground. He turned and waved Jenna back the way they had come. An unholy stench rose up, burning his nostrils, and behind him he heard Jenna gag. Inside the house, Duke let out a wail. The smell was very familiar to Kane, and he pulled the neck of his T-shirt over his nose. The overpowering stink surrounding them was death. A slight crunch of footsteps broke through the silence as a dark figure ran up the driveway. Kane dove around the garage and searched the darkness, but the intruder had slipped out of view. 
The next moment, Jenna was at his side. Damn it, they're getting away. She lifted her weapon and shot twice into the air, then raised her voice. Stop, or the next one will be in your back. In the distance, a car engine burst into life, and with a shriek of tires, a dark shape barreled out from behind a shed across the road, skidded onto the blacktop, and sped away without using lights. Kane dropped his gun and turned to Jenna. Who the hell was that, and what is that stink? I don't know, but the long gone. It's pointless giving chase now. Jenna covered her nose. If we had a flashlight, we could at least find out where the stink is coming from. She tugged at his arm. I don't think it's a good idea to go to the front door. Kane stared into the darkness. Nothing moved. I have my keys in my pocket. I'll get the flashlight out of my car. Don't! Her small hand closed tight, nails digging into his flesh. You'll have to go inside the garage, and we have no idea if anyone is lying in wait. Her voice lowered. It could be an ambush or a bomb. She looked up at him, her face a pale shape in the darkness. I'm not risking my house, either. We have no choice but to go back the way we came and call for backup. He rubbed the back of his neck. She did have a valid point, and he followed her to the back door of the cottage. If this is a well-organized trap, they could also be in my cottage by now as well. I'm not sure what Duke would do if strangers tried to get inside. I figure he would welcome them. We should check. Okay. Jenna slid back into the shadows. He followed her, sticking close to the wall. When they reached the back door, he touched her back, then signaled for her to be quiet. He listened intently, then whispered close to her ear, My floorboards creak, and I can't hear anyone walking around. He edged toward the open door. Cover me. He slid into the kitchen and did a reconnaissance of the entire house with Duke on his heels before calling Jenna inside. All clear. He shut the door behind her. This is getting stranger by the second. He moved around the rooms, closing the drapes, then switching on lights, and stopping dead at the sight of a red pool of stinking blood oozing under the front door. Oh, shit. Chapter 24 Covering her nose with her arm, Jenna gaped at the spreading crimson pool. Call for backup. She glanced at Kane. I hope there's not a dead body hanging on your door. I'm more worried about a bomb. He scratched the dark stubble on his chin. The blood could be a ploy to make us rush outside and take a look, in case someone is injured. They would expect us to follow duty of care protocol. He glanced around. It's not safe here. Unless the bomb has a timer, it isn't going to explode unless we trigger it. But I'm not taking any chances. We'll wait in the barn just in case. You'd better bring Duke. Jenna moved away from the door and followed Kane into the kitchen. Get Wolf and Rowley out here. Explain what happened. Tell them to proceed with caution and call me before they enter the property. She headed to the back door. As they hurried toward the barn, Kane explained the situation to the deputies. She used the keypad on a side entrance to gain entrance to a door set into the side of the barn, then turned on the lights. When Kane disconnected the call, she led him through the steel door and down a flight of stairs to a fully furnished safe room. I had hoped never to use this place, but it has everything we need to hole up until the cavalry arrives. Nice. I thought it was a storage area. He whistled and strolled around, looking in the bedrooms. This place is almost as big as my cottage. How come you've never told me about it before? She shrugged. It's a safe room, Kane, to keep me safe. Okay, I understand. He dropped into a chair at the small kitchen table. Jenna busied herself by pulling out the coffee maker and fixings. It was promising to be a long night. She glanced at him over one shoulder. I'm trying to figure out why my alarm didn't activate the moment someone came through the gate. If you remember, it was working fine when we arrived. Yeah, but you deactivated it when you went inside to get changed, didn't you? He shrugged. Maybe you forgot to reset it. Running her movements through her mind, she shook her head. She had forgotten once, 
after a near-fatal accident, and always double-checked since. No, I clearly remember juggling a bottle of wine and punching in the code. Then why didn't the intruder trigger the lights when they came onto the property? A cold shiver ran down her spine. They could have arrived before us. The lights have a delay and could have gone off again before we arrived. They didn't get into the house because I disabled the alarm when I went inside. She lifted her gaze to him. We know whoever was here parked behind the old shed across the road. They could have slipped inside your house while you were changing and deactivated the alarm after you left. Kane frowned. How? The door locked behind me. There's a hundred ways. You walk in and let the door swing shut behind you, and someone could sneak up behind you and catch the door before it closes. Dread made her heart race. You're saying they were inside the house watching me to get the code? She met his gaze with a shudder. I wonder what's waiting for me when I get home. You'll be fine, because I'm the target. You haven't received any threats. Kane moved to her side and leaned his large frame against the kitchen counter. They needed time to carry out their plan, and with your alarm and floodlights deactivated, they would have had plenty of time to set things up. His gaze slid over her. Just as well they didn't know about my silent alarm. A wave of panic rushed over her, and she pushed both hands through her hair. How the hell did they know about my alarm? She chewed on her bottom lip. I installed it myself. And although it's possible people might think I have sensor lights in the driveway, whoever came here tonight knew they are wired into the alarm. I have no idea. Kane raised one eyebrow, then turned away. It's going to be a long night. She handed him a cup of coffee. Really? We could be seconds away from being blown to pieces. Chapter 25 Jenna's cell phone rang, and she directed Rowley to approach the house. Aim your spotlights on the front door of the cottage, but keep well back. Yes, ma'am. What can you see? Jenna put her cell phone on speaker and glanced at Kane, who had not stopped pacing up and down. This is Wolf, ma'am. I'm looking through binoculars and seeing a patch of red liquid and an upturned black plastic bucket. There seems to be pieces of paper floating in the puddle and a note on the front door. No other foreign objects in the immediate area and nothing I can see anywhere on the porch or any wires at all. But anything could be under the liquid. Keep your distance and put a few rounds into the ground in front of the step. Kane moved to her side, towing Duke on a leash. They may have planted a pressure plate. The blood would cover it. Jenna listened as the SUV door opened, and Wolf used his rifle. Put, put, put. Then silence. All clear, ma'am. Rowley's voice came through the speaker. She heaved a sigh of relief. Hold your position. We're in the barn, and we're coming out. After handing Kane one of her halogen flashlights, she led the way out of the safe room. They skirted the cottage and sprinted to meet Wolf and Rowley. Jenna peered at Kane's front door and looked at her deputies. Suggestions? I'm familiar with explosives and tripwires. I'll do a recon of the area. Kane's expression went deathly serious. But I suggest we clear your house first, ma'am, as you believe someone has been inside. Jenna appreciated the fact Kane changed from friend to deputy in front of the others and nodded. Yeah, good idea but I doubt anyone had time to plant a bomb in my house. It would only take a few seconds to slip a device into your house, ma'am. Wolf strolled to the back of the SUV. I'll grab my kit. The smell of putrid blood drifted toward her on the breeze. She glanced up at Kane. Whatever happens here, you can't stay in the cottage tonight. You will have to bunk with me, unless you want to take a room in town. I'm not leaving you out here alone, and I doubt the motel allows dogs. Kane's expression was unreadable in the dark. I would rather be close by with a lunatic hanging around. He rubbed his nose and grimaced. Do you know a good cleaning service who works on Sundays? 
Jenna chuckled. You mean apart from clean as a wink? She took the gloves Wolf offered her and pulled them on. Yeah, I know a cleanup crew. I'll call them first thing in the morning. No need, ma'am. Wolf gave her a reassuring smile. Once we've checked out the area, bleach and a hosing down will fix it. Plus, I'm sure you don't want to advertise the fact someone is stalking Kane. I'm not being stalked. Kane gave him a reproachful glare. Vandalized and threatened, maybe. But whoever did this is trying to make a point. Really? Wolf snorted. Then why are we checking for bombs? If they wanted you to stop the pedophiles, they wouldn't be trying to kill you or Sheriff Alden. He glared at Kane. This is the killer warning you off. Jenna cleared her throat. Stand down, the pair of you. We'll do a sweep of the area just in case there are any explosives. In this situation, we can't be too careful. Whatever the reason, my security was breached. She glared at them. Stay alert. She turned to see Rowley looking at her with a wide-eyed, startled expression. Her young deputy was super efficient, but seemed to wilt if she barked at the older men. Yes? What is it? We'll need more vests, ma'am. Rowley pulled two from the back of the SUV. He handed her one and gave the other to Kane. I have two in the back of my car. She tossed Kane the keys. Don't forget to check underneath for bombs before you open the door. When he gave her a long, cold stare, she could have swallowed her tongue. How could she have forgotten Kane's wife had died in a car bombing before she opened her big mouth? Her face grew hot. I'm glad you're an expert on explosive devices. So am I. Kane's mouth formed a thin line when he handed her Duke's leash. Better keep him here. He may trigger a tripwire. She could sense the bad memories crushing down on him as she took the dog's leash. Okay. I'll help Kane, ma'am. Wolf scooped the vest from her hands and shrugged into it. Not that a vest will do much to stop an explosion. He strode toward her SUV, flashlight in hand. She glanced at Rowley. Don't ask. I wouldn't think of it, ma'am. Rowley's dark gaze narrowed. Who do you think has it in for Deputy Kane? Jenna kept her attention fixed on her deputies. She noticed the careful way both men surrounded her car, peering underneath and moving their flashlights in all directions. He had a call earlier this evening warning him off. This might be a ploy by the killer to get him to stand down. They obviously don't know him very well. The murders were all over the news this evening, but nothing was leaked about the links to the girls you found. Rowley tipped back his hat and scratched his head. Why would they threaten Kane? His reputation is untouchable, and the locals know it. When Kane opened the back of her SUV and pulled out the vests, she heaved a sigh of relief. She shrugged and turned back to Rowley. Most killers don't think logically. Whoever is killing the pedophiles believes they are doing a community service, and figure Kane is getting in their way. He was interviewing suspects today, and maybe he got close to the killer. She headed toward her house, with Duke following close to her side. Problem is, some people think jail is too good for pedophiles, and would turn a blind eye. I could see why there would be a split opinion. Rowley walked beside her and gave her an uncomfortable stare. People who were abused as kids and parents who lost kids to these creeps would be happy someone is killing them. He cleared his throat. We want to catch them and bring them to justice. I can see both sides of the argument. Jenna stopped walking. She had to admit she could see both sides, too. But her job was to enforce the law. We follow the letter of the law, and personal opinions don't apply. Not ever. Yes, ma'am. After waiting for Kane and Wolf to clear her house, she headed up the steps in time to see Kane checking the alarm system. Find anything interesting? You tell me. Kane's mouth twitched as he held up two wires torn from the main box. The floodlights, I gather. It didn't take a tech head to work out the wiring. The label you stuck on the control panel is a dead giveaway. He raised one eyebrow, and his lips quivered as he attempted to smother a grin. Give me a few seconds, and I'll have these reattached. What about Prince? 
She unhitched the dog's leash, then moved to Kane's side. Wipe down. Wolf came up the passageway and pointed to a small scuff on the floor outside the broom closet. I would say they parked across the road behind the barn, then walked here before you arrived. Kane mentioned he drove into his garage. You have a seven-minute turn-off delay on the lights, so he had plenty of time to return to the house. Is that correct? Yes. I jogged to the house, went inside, and disabled the alarm, got changed, reset the alarm, and came back here. The lights were working fine then. They hid the bucket of blood somewhere close. Wolf sighed. They followed you inside and hid in here. He swung open the door of a small cupboard and shone his flashlight inside. There are a few smudges of soil, but no footprints. When you went to Kane's, they disabled the floodlights and alarm. How did they know you planned to go over to Kane's cottage tonight? Rowley's questioning gaze moved between them. We went to dinner at the Cattleman's Hotel. It was crowded. Anyone could have seen us arrive in my vehicle. We chatted about watching a movie over dinner. Kane rubbed his chin. It's possible someone overheard us. They would have had plenty of time to get here before us and set this up, or they just got lucky. Jenna chewed on her fingernails, thinking. We spend a lot of downtime together. If someone has been watching us, they would assume we'd spend some time together after going for a meal. We usually do. Just a minute. Wolf held up a finger, then turned back to the front door. Do you often use a wedge to keep the door open? Jenna followed him. No, never. I noticed this when I came up the steps. Wolf pointed to a small wedge of wood on the porch. Come outside and close the door. He led the way. Jenna complied and watched as he slid the wooden wedge near the door hinge and the floor. Okay, I want you to go inside as you would normally. Wolf handed her the bunch of keys she had given him. She used the keys to open the door, strolled inside, and allowed the door to swing shut behind her. A few moments later, the door swung open, and Wolf smiled at her. The wedge prevented the door from closing completely, but not enough for you to notice. Oh, my God. Jenna shook her head in disbelief. I wonder if the killer was seated beside us at dinner. I can't believe you didn't notice if a suspect was close by. Wolf's astonished expression moved over Kane's face. Think, did you notice anyone at all? People were coming and going all the time. Nobody in particular registered with me. To be honest, I wasn't looking for a threat. I was concentrating on discussing the case and eating. Jenna sighed. Mr. Davis was chatting to George Miller and his wife when we arrived, but none of them are on our list of suspects. Yeah, I noticed them in the lobby. Kane cleared his throat. If we're done here, I'd like to check out the cottage now, ma'am. With the floodlights, it should be easy enough to find any tripwires. He patted Duke on the head. Stay here, boy. He picked up the flashlight and headed out the door. Jenna turned to the other deputies. Don't you stand there. Let's go. She followed them out the door. Ma'am. Wolf strode beside her. Leave this to Kane and me. We have specialized training in this area. They seem to be specialized in everything. She gave him a curt nod. Okay, we'll keep away from any potential blast zone. Be careful. Don't forget you have kids at home. Not for a second. Wolf flashed her one of his rare smiles, then jogged to Kane's side. Her heart raced as her deputies checked the area. As they moved around, she heard Kane's deep voice call out, Clear! When Wolf crouched at the crimson pool at the front door and Kane bent to take photographs with his cell phone camera, she wanted to run over to them but kept her distance. If it was a crime scene, the fewer people stamping around, the better. By the lowered voices, her deputies had found something significant, and her heart pounded in anticipation. Moments later, Kane waved her forward. Clear. Jenna took the face mask Kane held out to her and pushed it over her nose. The smell was disgusting. What do we have? Wolf is doing his test on the blood, but he thinks it's animal. It has fur in it, maybe from a cow. Kane indicated to the puddle, and his mouth turned down. In the blood are photocopies of old newspapers. 
Wolf will have to clean them up, but from what we can see from the headlines, they all feature missing kids. The sight of blood dripping from the innocent, smiling faces depicted in the newspapers made Jenna's stomach clench. She moved closer, trying to read the headlines. Some of them look old, yellowed. Yeah, they're all cut from old newspapers. Kane moved his flashlight to a few Wolf had laid in a line on the grass. Some of the articles are more than ten years old. Wolf will be able to get all the pertinent information and the names of the journalists. How many kids? Six, and all missing girls. Kane's eyes searched her face, then he moved his flashlight onto his front door. Then there's this. Scrawled over the images of Amos Price and Eli Dorsey were the words, Monsters Kill Kids. Jenna turned to Kane and waved a hand at the newspaper articles. Oh my God, do you think they mean Price and Dorsey killed these children? It sure looks that way. Kane removed his gloves with a snap, and his troubled gaze moved to her face. With both of them dead, we have no idea where they buried the bodies. We only have one option. Jenna frowned at him. Yeah, I know. We have to find the vigilante before they finish their killing spree. Chapter 26 Parked in the bushes, opposite the junction leading to Sheriff Alton's ranch, she sat in her car, tingling with excitement from her close encounter with the law, and watched the road. Sweat soaked her shirt, and her heart still raced from sprinting from the sheriff's ranch. It had been a stroke of luck to be standing at the reception counter of the Cattleman's Hotel when Deputy Kane called to make a reservation. It had given her plenty of time to work out a plan— Outwitting the sheriff would not be easy, and she actually admired her grit. Jenna Alton was one tough cookie, and not easily swayed by emotion. She wondered how the sheriff would react when she called Kane to give him the next clue. She could never explain to Kane how she knew where to find the missing girls. She would send him to the isolated Craig's Rock, then down the mountain to old Corky's place a deserted cabin a short distance from where one of the monsters lived. That would keep the sheriff and her team occupied for at least one day. A wave of anticipation of what was to come thrummed through her as she stared into the darkness at the sheriff's ranch. Some time had passed since a cruiser flew past with lights flashing, and in the distance a halo of illumination emanated from the sheriff's property. It sure looks like I have your attention now. Time for stage two. Chapter 27 A welcome, cool breeze lifted Kane's hair and brought with it the aroma of pine forests. He took a few steps away from the cottage to enjoy a lungful of clean air. He reluctantly strolled back to the front door, and glanced over at Rowley. The young deputy's hair was stuck to his face with sweat. It was way past two in the morning, and Rowley had worked nonstop to clean up the cottage with him after Wolf had gone home to be with his kids. They had spent most of the night scrubbing down walls and hosing away blood. Kane straightened his aching back and yawned. That will do. I'm bushed. Thanks for your help, Jake. It smells okay out here now, at least. Rowley dropped a sponge into a bucket and peeled off rubber gloves. Do you think Deputy Wolf will be able to save the newspaper articles? Yeah, he'll photograph them. He has software to bring out the print. Kane removed his gloves. I'm sure we'll be able to get copies via the library archives, if all else fails. Great. Jake pushed a hand through his brown, wavy hair. I'll head on home now. And upset our sheriff? Kane smiled at him. She invited us to sleep over, and trust me, the hot chocolate and cookies waiting for us will be worth it. He winced. I'd love to sleep in my own bed, too, but the cottage still has oh to death. He indicated to Duke asleep in the bushes. Even the dog won't go inside. He grinned. So, are you staying? Okay. Do you think she's in danger from this crazy? Rowley rubbed his dimpled chin. 
although you look like the target at this moment. Kane shrugged and stared at Jenna's house. Someone followed her into her house undetected, so they're good, real good. It has to be the same person who called me. I think they're sending me a message to leave them to administer street justice. We are all investigating the murders. Why target you and not the sheriff? I guess because I've been interviewing women who suffered abuse as a child. Kane collected the scrubbing brushes and dropped them into an empty bucket. The killer believes I get a thrill out of hearing them speak about child abuse. And your man. Rowley stood with his fists balled on his narrow hips. The sheriff told me about your early morning workout, so I gather she can handle herself pretty well. Jenna could take most people down single-handed, but that's not the problem. Whoever managed to get inside her house moves like a shadow, and they are fit. They took off running at impressive speed after they sprayed my house with blood. He glanced at Rowley. Don't worry. I doubt Jenna will let anyone get the better of her again. I haven't seen her fight, but she sure doesn't mess around when she's making arrests. Rowley grinned. She took on Rockford when she found him creeping around her house, and he is a big guy. She isn't weak, but Rockford had lost the element of surprise. He woke her, and she was able to grab her Glock and deal with the asshole. Kane sucked in a deep breath, then coughed out the chemical taste in his mouth. It's the ones you don't hear that are the most dangerous. Surprise attacks kill more people than by other means. I'd say if an intruder had a knife and got the jump on any of us, they could inflict a lot of damage. He sighed. Just to be safe, I'd like to make sure her security system is fully functional, and I'm too exhausted to deal with it now. Fixing the lights was easy. I'd say she'll be asleep anyway. Rowley glanced over to Jenna's house. I need to take a shower and get out of these stinking clothes, but it feels strange doing that at your boss's house. Kane chuckled. I know what you mean. You're welcome to use my spare room to shower and change if you don't mind the smell. Seeing Jenna's shadow move in front of the window, he lifted his chin. We'd better get a move on. She is awake and no doubt waiting for us. Okay, thanks. I appreciate it. I'll grab the bag from my car. Moments later, Rowley followed him inside and glanced around. It's bigger than it looks from the outside. Yeah, I gather it was built for the ranch manager some hundred years ago. Kane led the way down the passage, then pointed across the hall. Everything you need is in there. Fifteen minutes later, Kane sat at Jenna's kitchen table sipping hot chocolate. His head throbbed, and he had inhaled enough chemicals to drop an elephant. He raised sore eyes to her face. I'll be glad to hit the sack. It's been a long day. I'm starting to look like my dog. He rubbed the hound's head. I won't be able to sleep. Jenna nibbled on the cookie she had dipped in her hot chocolate. My mind is in overdrive, trying to figure out what the hell is going on. She sipped the beverage, and her gaze bore into him over the rim of the cup. I'm used to killers doing the deed than getting the hell out of Dodge, not dropping by for a visit and making threatening calls. She directed her attention toward Rowley. I would really like to find out if the vigilante suspects know each other. The support group idea is something we need to explore. She sighed. I feel like we're going around in circles. Did you find any associates of the murder victims? We found a few people who knew the murdered man, but none of them are friends. I'll say the same thing. They didn't socialize. Rowley's dark gaze lifted from his cup. There has to be a link. I think it's obvious. Kane shrugged. We have three murder suspects, all victims of child abuse. All the women, including the young girl Zoe, mentioned the men wore masks. That is the link. The men are the same group of people and have been doing this for years. Why do you think all the suspects are involved? Rowley placed his cup on the table and yawned. You made mention in the murder books that all the suspects were in town on the same day. I did wonder if the women contacted each other, but how would they know their names? The courts and media withhold the names of abuse victims. She drummed her fingernails on the polished wooden tabletop. Unless the vigilante followed the newspaper stories about missing kids, 
If they turned up alive, maybe they contacted them later in life. So we could have a group of women killing the men who hurt them. Rowley looked interested. The motive is there. They would want to stop them before they hurt another kid. You could be right. Whoever called Cain and vandalized his house has given us a clear indication there is a group of men kidnapping, molesting, and murdering kids. Jenna grimaced. I want to find out who is in this pedophile ring. Then we'll be able to catch the killer before they strike again. Easier said than done. Cain swallowed the bile creeping up his throat. They could be operating right here in Black Rock Falls under our noses. Exactly. I hope Wolf has a list of the missing kids from the newspapers by morning. From what I could see, they are spread from neighboring counties. The idea of so many kids dying by the hands of child molesters sent a jolt of adrenaline flooding through Cain. The weariness subsided and his mind zoomed in on the facts of the case. Yeah, and going way back, some ten years or so, it's going to be one hell of a job tracking down cold cases, and we'll be up against jurisdiction problems. I don't give a damn about jurisdiction. Jenna shot him a cold glare. I'll contact the other sheriff's departments personally and ask for their cooperation, which will be given. The local judges will offer up search warrants without a problem if we have probable cause. She nibbled on a cookie. We have to break this pedophile ring for two reasons. One, to stop the vigilante, and two, to prevent another kid from being kidnapped. I want a round-the-clock investigation. I have Walters taking the 911 calls on Sunday. I'll hold a meeting on Monday morning to allocate the workload, but we will need to go into the office in the morning and keep moving on the investigation. Sorry, guys. Can you make it in before ten? Kane nodded in agreement. The new deputies seem very efficient, and I'm sure they can hold the fort with Walters while the rest of us do the grunt work. Yeah, I agree. Jenna reached for another cookie. I want to be right in the middle of this investigation. I should have been with you when you interviewed the vigilante suspects, but I didn't want to lose the opportunity to speak to Zoe. Kane shook his head. With two cases on the go, you had little choice but to split the workload. We covered a lot of ground and have Angelique Bouvel to interview on Monday. Maybe we can speak to the Blackwater social worker as well. They might be able to give us a list of support groups in the area. I can't imagine a killer attending a support group. Jenna pushed a lock of black hair behind one ear and sighed. Then I have no idea what type of crazy we're dealing with this time. This year, I've seen different types of killers. Rowley glanced at Kane. From what you say, this type of lunatic comes in many varieties. Kane yawned and covered his mouth. Yeah, there are many different classes of killer. Knowing what type they are makes a difference. Jenna glanced at Rowley, placed her cup on the table, and stretched. They are all crazy. And the vigilante is another rung up the ladder to what we've been used to of late. Would you class a man who kills in rage, say, when he finds his wife cheating on him, the same type of killer as the man who murdered the schoolgirls last summer? Rowley ran a hand through his hair, making it stand up in all directions. You said he was a psychopath, so what is the difference? Cain wanted to sleep, but he owed Rowley an explanation. In very simple terms, in a crime of passion, like your first example, the men are blinded by fury, so really didn't know what they are doing. If it is a wife or lover who has hurt them, they usually attack the face. They usually show remorse or are shocked they have killed someone. A psychopath may or may not plan a murder, but they have no feelings toward their victim. The killing satisfies a selfish need in them, and most of the time in their minds they don't see murdering as wrong. Some of them truly believe it's normal to kill people. That's terrifying, Rowley sipped his drink. From what you said about the vigilante, they know what they are doing. I would say they are well-planned revenge murders. His face went blank as if deep in thought. So this is someone who doesn't fit neatly into either category. Kane leaned forward. Most psychopaths are driven by a trigger something bad that happened to them as a child. My guess is our killer is female and suffered abuse as a child. 
She may have heard or seen something that triggered the killing spree. Taunting me is another trait because they believe they have superior intelligence and can outwit us. They can't. Eventually, they make mistakes. The first one was contacting me, and the second was coming here tonight. Jenna's eyes flashed, and the third was underestimating me. Chapter 28 Sunday Jenna had woken at eight and strolled out of her room the following morning dressed in her workout gear. She went to the kitchen following the delicious aroma of fresh coffee. She found Kane looking as fresh as a daisy, nursing a steaming cup of joe. Good morning. Thanks for making the coffee. My pleasure. I've repaired your alarm as well, but you might want to ask Wolf to give it an upgrade. He smiled. I thought you'd want to work out, so I went home, fed Duke, and changed. Oh, and Rowley headed home. He will meet us at the office at ten. He had to feed his dog, too. Where is he? Duke, I mean. Asleep in his basket. I think we kept him up too late last night. He chuckled deep in his chest. Do you know he snores? Truly. And he runs in his sleep. Jenna poured a cup of coffee and added the fixings. He looks good now. I can't believe he is the same dog, and not a vicious bone in his body. After being mistreated, I thought he would be different. He is a hound dog. They're not known for having a bad temperament. He is gentle and very clean. Whoever gave him to the shelter must have been nuts. Kane smiled warmly. I haven't had a dog since I was a kid. He's great company. Jenna smiled at him, liking the glimpse into his secret past. He is lucky to have you. Thanks. Kane leaned his wide frame back in the chair, making it creak in protest. If we go into the office early, maybe we can be done in time to look at those horses. Jenna finished her coffee and stood. She needed a good, solid workout to clear her head. Maybe. Are you ready for me to kick your ass? Lead the way. Kane's blue eyes sparkled in amusement. I guess you can try. Before she left home, Jenna called Wolf and discovered he had wasted no time in collecting the information from the newspaper articles. That's great news. You must have worked all night. Yeah, I worked last night, but if you're going into the office this morning, I'll email it to you, unless you need me to report for duty, ma'am. Just send the list, and we can discuss anything else on Monday. Jenna frowned. She did not intend to steal his entire Sunday with his kids. I think you've done more than enough this weekend. Thank you. I appreciate you putting in the overtime. It's all part of the job, ma'am. I'll see you on Monday, unless the killer strikes again. Smothering a yawn, Jenna dragged a hand through her hair, not sure if she had brushed it, and sighed. I hope not. See you on Monday. She disconnected and gulped down her third cup of coffee in an effort to drive away the exhaustion. The cases had gnawed at her, and she had tossed and turned before falling asleep. The workout with Kane had been brutal, and now she had fallen into the slump from the adrenaline rush. She filled her takeout cups with coffee and headed for the door, glad to see Kane waiting in his black rig for her. His offer to drive her into the office had been most welcome, and she would enjoy the company. She opened the door and noticed Duke's head hanging over the back seat. She looked at Kane and raised one eyebrow in question. Is he a new recruit? She slid into the seat and deposited the travel cups in the console. Do you mind? Kane looked chagrined. I did promise to take him for a walk in the forest. You do know he can track a person by their clothing. She gazed at Duke's bloodshot eyes. He doesn't look as if he has the energy to keep his eyes open, let alone track anyone. He is fitter than you think. Kane's mouth twitched up at the corners as he started the car. She fastened her seatbelt. If we can process all the information we've collected for both cases for Monday morning, before lunch, I'll come with you to look at the horses. But I want boots on the ground until we solve these cases. Sure, I'll be glad for the company. Kane smiled at her. I'll be interested to see what info Wolf got from the old newspapers. Jenna stared out the window at the green fields flying by, 
not really listening. All she could think about was finding Zoe locked in the cage. She understood the fear of being at the mercy of brutal men. Her flashbacks were a constant reminder. When Cain cleared his throat in an unnatural way, she glanced over at him. Sorry, did you say something? He repeated the question. Yeah, we'll have names of missing girls and where they lived, at least. She sighed. They seem to have vanished into thin air. Cain flicked her glance, then returned his attention to the road. The earlier cases, opportunistic, I'd say, maybe by snatching kids walking home alone— we know pedophiles frequent online chat rooms to procure kids. They often like to share experiences as well, but these men are being extra careful. As we've drawn a blank on the murder victim's associates and the FBI have come up with Zip, we can't move forward on the murder cases until we interview Angelique Bouvel and the Blackwater social worker. I figure we should start by following up on the missing kids' cases from the newspaper cuttings left in the front of your cottage. Now we have access to statewide databases. We can check each name. Jenna pushed her hair behind one ear. If any of them are alive, they might have information we could use. What about Jane? I'm still waiting for the all-clear to visit her again. Now she has had time to get over the shock, she might be able to give us some more information. I hope so. I think finding the journalists who wrote the stories would be beneficial. Writing an article on a missing kid would be hard to forget. Kane turned onto the highway, and they followed a slow-moving tractor. They often have theories they can't print about suspects. It would be worth following up on them just in case we get a lead on the pedophile ring. Jenna picked up her coffee cup and sipped, allowing the rich brew to run over her tongue. Good idea. But as those missing girls came from all over the state— I'm going to run Price and Dorsey through the Montana Sexual and Violent Offender Registry and see if they have been active in other towns. They often list known associates as well. She glanced at him. We know about Stuart James McGregor, the magician, and I'm sure I received an email when he was released from jail. I didn't red flag him because he was classed as reformed and a minimal threat. They can't be reformed, Kane snorted in derision. It is a sexual preference they'll never change. He pulled up outside the sheriff's department and lifted the other cup of coffee from the console. Rowley has already arrived, and it looks like Weber has volunteered as well. Jenna heaved a sigh of relief. Great. We need all the help we can get. She slid from the car and headed for the door. She walked to her office, passing Rowley chatting to Weber. In my office, deputies! After waiting for her deputies to sit down, she went to the whiteboard and picked up the marker, then split the board in two down the center. We are dealing with two cases. They are intertwined, but we need to take a separate approach to both of them. She wrote Vigilante Killer on one side of the board and Pedophile Ring on the other, then listed the victims and suspects. She turned to face them. I'm going to run the names of the vigilante killer's victims through the Sexual and Violent Offender Registry. With any luck, if they have committed an offense anywhere in the state, the arresting officer will have a list of known associates. She moved back to her desk and sat down, then turned on her computer and waited for her emails to download. She located the file Wolf had sent her and printed four copies. Deputy Wolf has emailed me a list of the names of the missing kids, dates, and the names of the journalists involved with the cases. She lifted the copies from the printer and scanned them. Okay, we have six kids. Rally, you take the top three, and Weber, you take the last three. Feed the names into the state database and see if you get a hit. You will be looking for juvenile missing persons reports. Next, I want you to find a contact number for the reporter. You would be surprised how useful they can be if you speak to them off the record. She pulled out her notebook and checked the list she had made overnight. Kane, I want a list of all known associates of Lizzie Harper and Patty McCarthy. Maybe throw Angelique Bouvel into the pot as well. Find out if they are involved in any clubs or groups. Not one of the deputies made a sound. And apart from the strong scent of a variety of aftershaves, she would not have known they were there. She looked up from her notebook at their unblinking stares, handed the copies to the deputies, then sighed. What are you waiting for? Lives are at risk. 
get a move on. Maybe I need to start cracking a whip. Chapter 29 Dread had hung over Chris Jenkins like a storm cloud the moment the image of Amos Price flashed onto his TV screen, and the feeling had gotten worse with the news of the cops finding Eli Dorsey's dead body in a motel. His fingers had itched to call Bobby Joe, but keeping to the code they devised to prevent any outsiders from discovering their friendship, he climbed into his SUV and headed up the mountain road to Bobby Joe's house. After parking some way from the locked entrance to Bobby Joe's private road, he headed on foot to the old, dilapidated cabin. As he walked through the pine trees, he did a slow scan of the area to make sure Bobby Joe was alone. Satisfied, he dashed across his front yard and entered the house by the back door. The kitchen was empty. Dirty dishes overflowed the sink, and the place stunk of garbage and stale beer. Bobby Joe, where are you, man? Here, in the bedroom. I'm talking to my honey. Chris wiped the sweat from his brow and strolled into Bobby Joe's bedroom. Bobby Joe was seated at the computer and typing a response to someone in an online.